Hello, this is Michael Adams, and this is Nothing But The Truth, One Man's Journey is Blinded. It is January the 11th, 2016, and we are going to have a roundtable discussion on the flat earth, and uh, we are going to have uh, Jonathan from uh, Morgale, the YouTube channel, and uh, Globusters. We also have David Wise, and uh, David has a ton of things that he's in. He's in. He's got the deep inside the rabbit hole. Um, his YouTube channel, uh, website, uh, podcast, I believe. He's got uh, Ball Earth Skeptics on uh, Skeptics, excuse me, on Facebook. And then we got uh, was turning out to be a, a regular and a friend, um, becoming a close friend. I consider um, somebody I admire and respect a lot, Zen Garcia. And, of course, Zen, uh, he's got all sorts of things going on. He has, um, sorry, Zen, <laughs> Endeavor Freedom uh, YouTube channel. He's got the FallenAngelsTV.com. You can find him on... Dot .tv. Dot .tv. Dot .tv. Yep. Is it TV? Okay, my, my apologies. And, uh, well, he's all, you also have your two radio shows. Tell us about that as well. So we don't yeah, I do... Um, Truth Frequency Radio, Saturdays, 6 to 8 p.m., Secrets Revealed, and Wednesday evenings on Revolution Radio, um, Momentary Zen, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern. And plus you've written nine books, and your ninth book is pertaining to this, the discussion of tonight. Is hey David, did I miss anything? I'm sure I missed a couple things about what you're up to. Um. I have the Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole podcast that's available on iTunes and SoundCloud. Uh, my Facebook pages are Ball Earth Skeptic, um, All Things Flat Earth, and Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole, of course, and then also Exposing the Big Three, which is exclusively 9-11 Sandy Hook in Boston. And uh, everything is linked up on DeepInsideTheRabbitHole.com. Thank you. Jonathan, did I miss anything on your end that you need to be nope. Snoop, just just my YouTube channel, uh, the Morgile, and uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> okay, great. And, and the so, soon coming book. Yeah, yeah, the soon coming <laughs> book one day. <laughs> yeah. So I think this is going to be a very interesting show. Uh, how it will turn out? Uh, I guess we'll just it's going to be a free a free flow discussion about uh, the flat Earth and uh, many of the aspects that uh, that pertain to it. Uh, I just want to mention a little bit about this week. I know that um, there's a kind of a, an upset and a stir with uh, some of the things that uh, Tiger Dan uh, is in his recent videos. And uh, first of all, I've reached out to Tiger and invited him to come on the show to, to express his point of view. But I, um, I just want to say that I, I do appreciate a lot of what Tiger Dan has done. I think everyone on this panel does as well. And I think that whatever the misunderstandings are, I hope that they are resolved soon. Um, because really, you know, I understand some of the frustration that the Tiger Dan is feeling, as we all are, in trying to suss the piece, suss out the pieces, and try to make sense of our world. Certainly, the big issue, uh, as far as I see it, is is 2016, and we still have doubts and, and and misunderstandings. Why are they hiding the world that they're hiding from us? I think it shall be um, a good conversation tonight to talk about that as well. Anyways, with that, um, <clears throat> what I was thinking about doing is starting out uh, and talking a little bit about um, Jonathan's uh, recent three-part video series uh, about the, the, the one of the major problems that we have you know, whether you're a flat earther or a globalist, it doesn't really matter. We don't have accurate, um, um, reliable information as far as our world looks. And it, it is very frustrating. And for many of us, our hands are tied because we don't have the access and ability to retrieve uh, this. But it seems to me that certainly in 2016, the powers that be, uh, you know, whether it's the Jesuits or Freemasons or whatever it is, the ruling elite surely must know this and they're hiding this from us. So I would like to 
We'll start out with this, John, if, you, if you're game. Let's talk a little bit about your recent video series that you just did. Yeah, sure. And um, first off, it's it's only just like 30 plus minutes. It's like slightly more than 30 minutes, but I'm bound to 15 uh, minute chunks. And so the last, the third section was literally like two or three minutes long. And so I just uh, put a song in the end there too. So it's just a 30 minute video because um, it was really just sort of synchronicity that I I was working on, you know, just looking at some different ways to construct the matrix that we use to map out, you know, relative distances, because you can change certain variables and come out with totally different maps and they would still technically work in a navigational sense. Um, But so I was working on this at the same time that Tiger Dan, you know, comes out with a video calling all flat earthers who sort of subscribe to, or I guess you could say push, an azimuthal equidistant map matrix where the Antarctic is sort of, you know, around the outside. Um, He says, anyone who says that is a liar uh, because of the flight from Sydney to Chile in 13 or 14 hours or something like that. Um, So to me, you know, one of the things I've said for a long time is that we don't have any accurate maps in a sense that they accurately represent the face of the Earth, like a snapshot of the face of the Earth. Even the Mercator projection, which is sort of a conventional map that we still use today, um, just the simple nature of it, it's uh, <laughs> the, the nature of the way the map is, is made uh, skews relative sizes of continents and relative distances between continents the further you get from the equator. So it's by definition, it's a, it's a cylindrical conformal map. And so by definition, it's more and more skewed up to infinity when you get to the polar regions. So it, it technically could not possibly be an accurate representation of what the Earth actually looks like. Um, I think one of the things that we'll touch on, however, is that uh, Mercator may or may not have been a flat earther. I think it's very possible that he was. And in fact, he did sort of come out with, I guess you could say, a flat Earth map with the North Pole in the center. So, you know, this is a big, big issue for the flat Earth community. And it's it's something that we've been sort of kicking around and trying to figure out for a good long while. Um, You have to have a map and you have to have a model. And the AE map sort of does work for, you know, demonstrating how this stuff sort of works or how we think it works. Um, We know for sure that the Earth isn't a spinning globe. That's for sure, um, but I just think it's uh, it's a little bit naive to try to ascribe what the sun is doing, you know, to take what the sun is doing and to uh, sort of use that to prove what the earth looks like. Um, we really don't know what the sun is doing, and just because, say, it's 12 o'clock noon here while it's midnight there, you know, then we sort of, you know, we have to put these two points on the opposite ends of the North Pole. And I don't know, it just seems like maybe there's something that we're missing in that regard. So, you know, it's, to, to me, it, it's still sort of a big mystery what everything actually looks like. It doesn't look like the Mercator projection, I don't think. Um, maybe it does, but I just really don't think that the Mercator projection accurately represents the face of the Earth. And I don't think the azimuthal equidistant does either. Um, the AE map, which I'll just simply call the azimuthal equidistant map, I'll just say AE because um, it's easier. Uh, but the AE map is most correct at the very center, and it gets less and less correct the further away you get from the center. So really none of the maps we have are, are accurate, and I, I just don't, you, you know, I, I think it's great that Tiger Dan's looking at this because it is an issue. It's something that we need to solve, but to take that and say, you know, anybody who, who says the Antarctic is on the outside or anyone who says the Antarctic doesn't exist is lying, Um I don't remember anyone saying it doesn't exist, but anyway, yeah. that's my two cents on that. Uh, I'd like like to jump in on that. He he did come out and aggressively say that uh, all flat earthers say that Antarctica doesn't exist, and that you know that's just unlike him. I don't know him. I've seen his interviews. I I've, I've watched his you know it, um, him on uh, Patricia's show. I've watched all his videos. I'm a pretty good judge of character just by listening to the way people talk and their, the way they express themselves. And he seems like a very uh, loving, religious, kind man, intelligent. But his argument of, you know, these flights exist from uh, South America to Australia, and they obviously fly over um, Antarctica because, look, here's pictures from windows. Well, 
that's not proof at all. I mean, there's, there's sightseeing flights that I've seen video of where it kind of looks like the same thing. You know, who's to say that those, are, those pictures are from these flights? I took his information um, with the airport codes that he says. I put it in Expedia. I put all different dates in there, and it says we've searched 400 airlines, and there are no nonstop flights. Now, I know that there are some listed somewhere because I've seen the result come back before, but who is to say that airline technology has uh, um, it's probably increased since the 1960s, although they haven't really shown us much, and who's to say that they don't have aircraft that can go a thousand miles per hour can break the speed of sound. The only thing they'd have to deal with is excessive fuel usage and a sonic boom, possibly. Maybe they found a way around it. And if you're going to fly, you know, if, if uh, these maps are semi right, I don't think that they're actually right. And Antarctica is the plane that surrounds our thermal pocket. um, Who's to say that they don't fly South, fly over the ice, fly East or West until they get over to the other side and then fly north uh, to their location. Well, you know. I, don't even, I don't even think that's necessary, though, because if you look at even the, the model that Robotham was describing, and, you know, I don't just blindly agree with everything Robotham said, but, you know, he did make a lot of really excellent points in Zetetic Astronomy, which I've only read the original edition. I haven't read the, the expanded editions, but the model that he was describing was looking at um, – you know, historical navigation, practical sailing charts, and and the the captain's logs and that sort of thing. And if you measure the distance between uh, Australia and South America, it's only about 8,000 miles nautically, according to the model that Robotham was describing. Which actually, if you add up all the distances of these far southern ports, um, you get I think it's 22,000 miles at the average 45 degree latitude which is just too darn big for a globe of the given uh, proportions. So, you know, it's, it, it's very good proof right there that there's something wrong with the conventional heliocentric model. But it also shows that such a flight could be done even at an average of 500 miles an hour. It would only take about 16 hours. And I think that by flying not exactly west, because remember in, in Robotham's model or the, the conventional flat earth model, west is a curve. It's not a straight line, and so if you could just uh, basically do a straight line instead of a curve, I could see them shaving off some of that distance and, and doing the flight comfortably in 13 hours. I don't. Jonathan, think I, I could agree with that 100%. The point I was kind of trying to make was um, Tiger Dan's videos were not like him. That was not – I'm not saying it wasn't him. It was unlike him. It was the opposite – of who he is. So yeah. what, what? I, I would like to interject here a little bit because I think uh, I might have part of the reason why he is behaving the way he is. And I also would like to have Zen express this as well because we both come from, uh, you know, Christian backgrounds. And one of the things I've noticed from my own experience since I started doing this and started reaching out to folks like you, having you on my show and uh, expressing my conviction that the world is not a ball and that I, and that I don't believe in the heliocentric model and that I'm in line with the flat earth geocentric model is that I have had a lot of attacks from quote unquote Christians. Now I understand this might not be a, a very good reason for why he did it, but I'm trying to explain it just simply what might be the motive for why he pushed back so hard because he's probably getting the snot kicked out of him like I am and I can tell you I'm sure that Zen's going through the same thing and this issue and other issues from quote unquote people that call themselves believers in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and behave the complete opposite and I think it's this bogus argument that's thrown at us constantly that we are an embarrassment and that we are, are uh, a distraction and that we are causing division and that uh, we're making Christians, quote unquote Christians, look like a joke. I don't know if that makes any sense to you gentlemen, but I know from my own personal experience, and I would like to have Zen comment about that. And, it, and um, whether we agree with that or not, that's, at the end of the day, I would like to have Dan, Tiger Dan on to talk about it because I think that uh, my hunch, my gut hunch, 
and only for my own. I mean, just today, uh, attack from somebody <clears throat> that I wanted to be on my show that has a lot of great information about that other topic, about the Jesuits and their connections with Hollywood and who will have nothing to do with me because because of the flat earth. Because he, even though I didn't want to talk to him about that, I didn't want to talk about his work, he didn't want anything to do with me. And I'm not going to mention his name. And, and, the, and then the, night, the day before, Yesterday was another somebody who was a regular guest on my show who will not have anything to do with me. And says that you should call your show, your show instead of uh, nothing but the truth. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Nothing but uh, there's a search for the truth. He says you should call your show the search for the truth. You know what I mean? It just went on this rampage. So I, I wanted to have Zen to, to share his experience, and I know at the end of the day this is not the explanation for it until. Tiger actually talks about, but I do think that part of this is the amount of social pressure in his own community about this. Does that make sense, gentlemen? And then Zen, would you comment it, on that? It um, it snapping because of pressure. I, this is to me just seems like something more. Um, and, but before I got cut off, I just want to put about one last point was I totally agree with Jonathan that, you know, we don't know which map is right, that they're all kind of wrong. But the only thing that we know for sure is that we don't live on a spinning ball. I mean, that's beyond the shadow of a doubt. So I, I agree that's wholeheartedly. Cool. Yeah, what, what I was going to say is to people, uh, sorry to interrupt, but to, and this would just be real brief, but uh, to people who think, you know, that this is a joke and who call you a joke for talking about this, you know, the joke is the world is actually a stationary plane, and the joke is actually on you. <laughs> You're the punchline of that joke, and that's why it's so ironic because people take this pretentious attitude like, you know, uh, we're so stupid and we don't understand physics, but if you actually take the time to look at this instead of just dismissing it like we're all programmed to do, um, you actually find that there's something to this because it's actually the simple, honest-to-goodness truth. So, yeah. I know myself personally that I was extremely hesitant, as I'm sure that many of you were, um, to when many of my listeners were sending me videos and asked me to look into the flat earth that, I completely thought it was farcical and that I was hesitant to do so. But then being open-minded and not passing judgment on a topic that I had not looked into and investigated, I decided to approach it and to you know spend some time thinking I was going to be able to debunk it in a very short time. And then when I realized that you know, the – Basically, the science actually confirms that the Earth is stationary and that it's not moving and it's immobile and fixed and that there's no measurable curvature. Well, those two things in my mind just completely blew the whole um, belief system as far as the heliocentrism and that we're spinning once daily as we annually orbit around the sun completely out of the water. And then from that point, point forward I wanted to know more and I wanted to come to understanding as to how it was and why it was that we were led astray and how all of us have been indoctrinated into a belief that we never even second guess that we are actually living on a globe and that the earth the shape of the earth is spherical and that we're part of this solar system with these other eight planets and how all of us have been lied and led astray and bought into all of that. And so, you know, it's only been since um, last Jan uh, June or July for me personally on this. But the thing that really brought me to understanding was um, being able to apply the flat earth as model to decrypt the book of Enoch, which is about my last book. My ninth book was about this particular topic, the flat earth as key to decrypt the book of Enoch. But I know that in the last year, in the journey of coming to understanding on all the things that are connected to this as revelation, that this is so huge that I'm still in process of reassessing, re-evaluating, 
and reconfiguring all that I had once thought that I knew. And that goes to, you know, as far as the universe, what are planets, wandering stars, um, the enclosed dome system, the firmament, whether it's solid, is it glass? I mean, there's so many questions that have to now be investigated and that we have to open ourselves up to, um, I'm, you know, all of us, we are all trying to reassess and to make sense of all of these things and come to an understanding which can help, um, help to justify what we see in world as, as far as our experience of being here, part of part of existence, part of the creation, what we see every day as far as the sun moving um, from east to west, the, the moon also spinning in that way, and then trying to um, shake out all of the lies that we are told daily by NASA and science and by these PhD degrees and all these professional opinions. and And so all of us are trying to come to better understanding of what is really going on in the world. The one thing that we do know is that it is most certainly not as they told us it was. And so, and also, you know, as far as NASA and all the lies that they have put forth and perpetuated and propagated, they do not deserve any benefit of the doubt. We most certainly did not go to the moon. And the whole thing is that they are still, um, they just released article not even long ago talking about how the Van Allen radiation belts are, even to this day, an impenetrable barrier for them being able to go out into outer space, you know, so... Um, there's a lot that we don't know, and there's a lot that we are trying to come to rediscovery on because a lot of this has been lost and forgotten, forbidden and hidden um, knowledge, and that the ancients, you know, previous to the uh, the embrace of the heliocentric model, that they knew a lot of things that we no longer um, uh, except as a fact, you know, things like the magnetic um, mountain, the, this whirlpool at the, um, at the, at the very North pole, um, the, you know, and that this particular magnetic mountain is, could be the cause for the lunar eclipses. We most certainly know that it, because some lunar eclipses have occurred when the sun and the moon are still, up in the you know above the horizon that it's not the shadow of the earth because the earth is always below uh, the circuit of the sun and the moon that there's something that we don't understand that causes and comes into play with these lunar eclipses and so there's a lot of things that uh, we are still trying to determine and make sense of and the whole thing with the maps yeah, that's one of the things, the flights and so much. I mean, this is the mother of all conspiracies. It is so all-encompassing, so grand, so massive in scale that it's absolutely mind-blowing us to those of us that wake up to it that they were even able to perpetuate it for even 10 years, much less the last five centuries. You know, it's it's absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, that's certainly that's certainly how it appears. Um, you know, when you look at people like Mercator, who again, you know, he's responsible for the Mercator projection that we're familiar with, which is basically, you know, the cylindrical conformal map. But then he also did one that's, I guess you could say, sort of like an azimuthal or uh, equidistant or like an AE map, but it's got the the north in the center, and everything sort of wrapped around the north like you're sort of used to seeing in the AE map, but it's got some features um, that I think are interesting, like the, the north being a lot larger than we think. It's, uh, in other words, the 90-degree latitude isn't just a single point or possibly isn't a single point. It could be like a ring, and that would change the matrix, matrix of the map. But 
um, yeah, I think there's definitely something to that. And I think um, that's sort of the reason for the whole Antarctic and the Arctic treaties. Um, so, yeah, I'm definitely with you, and that's very, very well put. Mm, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, before I carry on to to another topic, uh, David, you, would you like to continue with this? or? Um, I just want to mention that, you know, we're told lots of different things about Antarctica and the North Pole, and the truth is we don't really know very much. You know, it's still been – hasn't been, perf- you know, confirmed that there's 24 hours of light, you know, on December 21st or, or um, during their, their – that time of year for them. There's, you know, the Admiral Byrd story. How real is that, you know? What, what right. really happened? And, and, I, and I say, you know, that – we have to be careful as truth seekers not to believe everything. Like, like you know, the um, the space shuttle when they're when they're talking about the, um, the when they had the the tether, you know, 15 mile tether, and it broke, and then they're watching it and they're seeing all of this, you know, extraterrestrial life or interdimensional <laughs> right, things right. going on, and and then and then the, the the announcer like didn't know what to say, and they're like, you know, they're busted, you know, they're feeding us this stuff. They're yeah, feeding us. True. The, 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 every, you know, like the pictures Richard Holdwind finds on Mars, you know, look, right. they didn't notice there was a squirrel and there's this and there's that. <laughs> that is just to take truth seekers and make them run with it. These are red airings that are, that are really programming us and they're using us to spread the, the lies. That's, well, that's a good that's point. A, I was going to say a little bit. About it. Oh, go ahead, David. Sorry, I was just going to say that it's sort of ironic because, you know, if you, if an average person hears the phrase flat earth, that's going to seem like the biggest red herring. You know, it seems like the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard. I'm sorry. I mean, that's just the way that it seems. Um, But you're right. I mean, uh, to me, if you revisit that tether footage from NASA, uh, it looks like probably particulates in the underwater pool that they're in. But anyway. (laughs) But, but, uh, But again, that was done on purpose. They didn't, they didn't grew up in the pool they wanted us they want to feed us you know there's the famous thing where um they showed a shot from supposedly the space station where there was an et uh, craft we'll just call it a little speck of light and then something shoots up from the ground and they're like this is proof that we have you know scalar weapons and that we're fighting off aliens and nasa happened to have the live feed on and then it immediately went dark you know and then they deleted it no right. that was that was done that was just fed to us, and then we're running with it. And, right. uh, you know, I used to believe in these things. I'm like, look, we've got this. But now that I know that NASA is not real, um, it, it's all just fed to us. And, you know, so even when something is fed right to me that lines up with everything I believe about whatever conspiracy, false flag, hoax, or whatever, I have to look at it and say, who's telling me this? How do yeah. I know it's true? You know? Yeah. It's very so. true. You know, it's funny. It's what you, you have a very valid point there, David, because I look at my own journey, and like a, a year and a half ago, I never even heard of heliocentric or geocentric, and they were never talking about these two particular models, were they? They were it, long before you ever get to the point of even becoming a little, I guess, more sophisticated in the issue. You're bombarded with all these make-believe stories that are clearly there as a form of social programming if you will would that be the proper term somebody just dropped off that would have been yeah there. hopefully he'll come, come back on if he doesn't i'll bring him on so but uh um, i'm back yeah. okay cool uh, so i don't know if you heard what i said before he dropped off but it seems to me that, that you have a very strong uh valid point here that uh long before i ever and i think all of us have this experience so uh, uh, tell me if i'm wrong that we went through this gauntlet of all these fake stories before we even heard about the heliocentric model or the geocentric model. Is this correct? Yeah, I never knew that. I never knew there was a debate to be had. I mean, we we're all pretty well raised under the assumption that it's a foregone conclusion, and there there is no debate. We we all had the same you know uh, experience learning about the flat Earth. I had my rabbit hole show. People sent me stuff. For six months, I just deleted it. I refused right. to even look at this idiocy. And then finally, somebody convinced me to look at something. I was like, wait a minute. That's crazy. Let me see another one. And then I basically went underground for two weeks trying to blow it up. And the deeper in the hole I went, you know, the worse it got. 
And then I came out the other side saying, this is unbelievable. And then I kept quiet for a couple of months um, because I was afraid it was going to discredit everything I've done on 9-11 Sandy Hook in Boston. And then I, I realized, you know what? It's gonna, but I don't care because the yeah. truth is the truth. Yeah, that's the way I was too. And, here, here. and a, a couple of few other things is, you know, like um, they have all these supposed people that come out and say they were part of the uh, Mars Space Command. And just recently they had, um, I believe it was a major general, he came out and he was talking about how um, we have all these United Defense Forces, you know, the Space Command and all this. And they are doing exactly what David is saying. They're releasing these stories. They're trying to perpetuate this mindset. And we also know that this whole heliocentric, as far as being tied to the strong delusion, that it's going to, there's one more chapter yet remaining. Even with what Warner Von Braun had told to Carol Rosen, that the next Trump card, the next domino to fall, is that the ancient aliens uh, coming from way out there, that they are the creators of humanity. And what I've learned as far as these so-called extraterrestrials or ancient aliens is that they are coming from beneath the earth and that they have, they are here, have been here, and they're trapped here. They're not from way out there. They're demonic entities fallen angel, angelic type powers, principalities, these rulers of darkness. And, um, and, and, but the next thing is that they are our creators and that's why we can't find the, the missing link, you know, that they're, we're not, you know, cause they jumped the gun on evolution. And so, so many people are ready and willing to buy, um, buy into that and to bow down to these Anunnaki gods. It's, well, it's, Think about it. I mean, look at the programming. You know, what are the biggest movies out there? We have, you know, it's all about Star Wars, Star Trek. It's all about aliens and and perpetual war and uh, you know and gods coming, you know, that are smarter than us. Right. So they they they're programming us with this. You know, right now, you know, it's all about war because they, you know, the Rothschilds fund both sides of every war, and you know, the people that are controlling everything, war keeps us in a disconnected state of fear, disconnected from God, disconnected from our power. And, you know, that rules. And, and once we're tired of this, they're going to have a bigger war. You know, they're going to fake an alien invasion. Um, as far as, you know, you said that the, the, the extraterrestrials are, are, they come from below us, they're demons. I'm not even sure we're on the top layer. We might be below another layer. You know, what's above the firmament, if there is a firmament, what's outside of, uh, of as far as we can go? Maybe there's other thermal pockets. There's all different theories. I don't, I'm not claiming right. any of them to be real. But if you think of the word extraterrestrial, those are extra beings from this terrestrial plane that we're on. I, I, you know, if there's extraterrestrials where I kind of lean towards there's, there's probably other very humanoid-looking some things out there that they come from this terrestrial plane. They're not coming from, you know, specks of dust in an infinite cosmos. You know, there's so much to learn, really. You know, I, I, I would like to bring up, I'm doing exactly what I said I wasn't going to do. So but this would be the last thing that I should really interject too much about. But uh, the uh, International Space Station supposedly is shutting down, right? Uh, there's rumors out there that the International Space Station is shutting down that uh, NASA is supposed to have nothing planned for five years, um, that all these rumors are out there suggest- saying that uh, they're closing shop. I heard why they're closing down. It's Globebusters has exposed them, and they have to close <laughs> down. <laughs> well, no, this, yeah, I probably some of that I can see that. Yeah, I can see it too. Uh-huh. I mean, they, they're pointing out that... They, the I have got some good stuff on them. Uh, there was one particular that, that I thought was pretty funny. Uh, the ISS was floating around up there, uh, you know, or whatever it is they're doing, but the sun was shining directly into this camera lens, and from the angle of the, the sun or whatever that light is up there, <laughs> um, I don't even know if it's real, but the, the angle of the light shining into the lens ca- casts a reflection of the make, uh, the make of the, you know, the manufacturer of the camera, 
and apparently somebody you know did some research and I think it was Dicon D I K O N or something some kind of camera but uh shouldn't have been on there so yeah we, we find there's lots of little good uh easter eggs to be found throughout the the Globusters ISS watch shows I mean there, there's just so much and uh wouldn't surprise me but uh isn't SpaceX going to be taken over yeah that's another thing I wanted to talk to you gentlemen about that is SpaceX and uh what uh we talk maybe a little bit about uh uh, Jaren's recent video, but also the fact that uh, what is this all about? What's going on? What, it seems to be more theater. That's all they're giving us. And then this whole thing about the International Space Station and this closing, and NASA pretty much doesn't have anything really in the next five years. But that's right after they said they were going to be doing something with Mars and all this other nonsense. It's just all playing into their, and this is certainly speculation, but it seems Suspect, suspect to me why they're closing shop. I don't know how you gentlemen feel about it, but it seems a little suspect. If it is even true, um, what are they doing? What are they really about? Is this what uh, Zen talked about, where it's they're going to fake the alien stuff now because it's not working, and they realize they're starting to lose a grip on their false narratives and their their fairy tales. If I was writing the excuse me, if I was writing the screenplay for them. I would have an alien attack the space station and kill everyone on board. The start. Right. <laughs> It'd be a blockbuster, I'm sure. <laughs> I think a lot. You get all the screens out there on Central Park and all that, and everybody would show up. Right. <laughs> they would certainly garner sympathy, just like with the, you know, the the shuttle um, the shuttle explosion, and how all of those individuals are still alive and. Uh, living out their lives and teaching in other places. And, yeah, that would be, um, you know, do it spectacularly and you can just end it and uh, turn the next chapter and um, also increase your funding for whatever other projects you decide to perpetuate and um, propagate and lie about. And and we know, like, even with um, the Mars rover missions, all the things like, that they found, um, you know, these alien skeletons or whatever it is that they keep bringing forth. Cause there's all so much of it, you know, as far as the, the Mars rovers and that they found an ancient book on Mars or whatever. It, it's just crazy. Oh, <laughs> you know, wow. with the, with the Mars Rover technology, I don't know how there's dead cell phone spots just outside of town. I mean, they're <laughs> able on this, on this little thing so far from the sun with little solar power panels, um, are able to transmit, you know, pictures back to Earth when, you know, when it it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you put basically you just put two of those, four of those on the planet, you're done. You know, <laughs> on satellites. Right, and if you, actually, if you look at it logistically from from sort of the, a radio frequency wave perspective, it's not even possible to transmit radio frequencies the distances they claim to, especially like if you look at things like Pioneer 10 which allegedly went to Jupiter, you know, through the asteroid belt to Jupiter in the 1970s, which is 360-something right. million miles um, on the computing power of a Nintendo Game Boy, basically, or less, um, no pilot, and, and somehow beam back, you know, using 1970s technology, you know, images of Jupiter through the asteroid belt. And if you look at the timetable of that, you know, supposed journey of Pioneer 10, the, the timetable doesn't add up. So, yeah, NASA's just been lining their rears off about everything. Right. I, I, you made the comment, uh, radio waves, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, I, I have no way of proving this, but it sure makes a lot of sense to me. Is You know, radio waves uh, don't travel forever. They break up. Sound waves, you know, certain sound waves uh, will travel farther um, over distance, but then it just disperses. Um, you know, like earthquakes, the way they tell where the epicenter of an earthquake is, is um, there's three different waves that come out of an earthquake, and over time they travel at different speed and they break up. Some of them don't go as far, and they measure the distance. So the farther you are away, the less severe it is, and uh, some of the waves don't even make it to the end. And I say it's the same thing with light waves. And the light doesn't travel for billions and billions of miles. It only travels for maybe a couple thousand miles. And, you know, on, the only light that we can see is within this very small world that we live on. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, I, I tend to um, you know subscribe to the model where uh, instead of infinite space, you just have a, a possibly infinite plane, the physical plane here on the ground, and there could be other worlds. I'm not, I'm definitely not ruling that out. And you know, I've sort of been a UFO enthusiast for many, many years, and so that that sort of you know has a soft spot for me, I guess you could say. Um, <laughs> at the same time, I have never seen any good evidence that we actually live in an enclosed system. So I'm always leaving the possibility open open that the the plane, the physical plane, stretches out anywhere to up to and including infinity. Um, but space, on the other hand, is merely just a, a feature of the world. Um, and if you think of the celestial bodies as all being basically on the same plane, um, you know, perhaps they're limited to our world. Perhaps they keep going. I mean, we really we really don't know. Um, not too many people have, uh, at least recently really uh, surveyed the far southern region. So we're just all, we're basically going on assumptions that have been around, you know, for hundreds of years. And it's just so convenient, you know. And if light doesn't travel, you know, more than a few thousand miles, we don't know what's past the outer rim or above us. You know, we can only see so far. And then, you know, if there's another system, another dome, and, you know, another layer, another you know, spiritual layer, whatever it is, um, the light, the energy doesn't make it to us, so we just can't sense it. Well, you know, if you if you look at what people are saying, if you look at the narrative behind UFOs, they're either 100% real or they're 100% fake. But, I mean, I, I've seen things that are so convincing that uh, people have been, you know, witnessing and, and putting down images of UFOs for, you know, hundreds of years throughout history. So, you know, if we're going to just discount all that, um, then we have to, you know, discount all of it. But if there's something to it, um, if you just sort of hypothesize if there's actually something to the UFO phenomenon that we're not, you know, that our governments are not doing, because I think they're doing some of it, um, but if there's something extraterrestrial to it, it's actually theoretically possible <laughs> you know, with the flat earth model, if you consider there's, it's possibly an infinite plane and these beings don't have to travel, you know, hundreds of light years through space and somehow find our little planet in the that, little corner of this galaxy that doesn't exist. I mean, you can't even talk about the orders of magnitude, how much more likely and possible that is than the official ET story. I mean, I believe in ETs, you know, because I wanted to believe in them, but I'm like, God, how would they really find us? You know, maybe they're out there, but they'll never come here. But they're already here. They're all here. That's where it all comes from, you know. You know, this would be a really a good point to bring in Zen about his research from uh, the book of Enoch and like the, the, like the six gates that he goes, that he talks about the moon going through and what he saw and as he was taken up, um, you know what I mean? Would you be willing to go on that a little bit? Yeah, I'll, but I want to comment on something first from the Emerald Tablets. Because um, in, in the Emerald Tablets, it talks about how a, a time during the Atlantean age when they were opening these stargates and these portals, sort of like you know what CERN may be involved in even now. And if they are able to open stargates and have this, um, wormhole technology, and it also mentions these interdimensional and um, like interdimensional frequency type beings being called up from the below, invited into this space plane, and so that's another whole um, something that we have to consider as well. Even if it's not technology such as like UFO technology or um, anti-gravity technology, chariots of fire, whatever you want to, um, that possibly they're able to breach if there is some kind of boundary to this system, um, something you know beyond that we don't know, and if there is something that keeps them here and from escaping or keeps something from being able to get in, if they're able to, to breach and to, to make that kind of uh, jump using such technologies um, because there's it, it is also my opinion that there's something more to CERN than you know on the surface and what we are to be know about and that the public is 
uh, privy to as far as that kind of knowledge. And and then there's, well, there's other speculation, but of course, who really knows of these jump room technologies? Um, people talk about um, possibly um, using such jump room technologies to go to different time space dimension, but who really knows? I mean, this is all really speculation, but yeah, the book of Enoch does speak of 10 heavens and Enoch was taken up uh, by the angel Uriel and taken through even because I did a show just this past Saturday speaking about how the North, the North pole is supposed to be like a, a gate, a doorway, a portal, and that the, um, the mountain there, the magnetic mountain that this is supposedly a Mount Meru or Mount Moriah or Mount Olympus that the gods and even Elohim, uh, even in the, the scriptures that speaks about the throne of God as being on the very top of the, the firmament. Um, and even that, you know, even in Isaiah chapter 40, it speaks about he that sitteth on the circle of the earth and, how the heavens were spread out of the curtain, fitted to the um, to the circle of the earth, and that together they form a shape of a tent or a tabernacle. Uh, in Isaiah 66, it speaks about that the the earth is the footstool of the Most High, and in Enoch, when he was taken up through these heavens, he was brought before the face of the Most High, and he it says that. Um, the cherubim and the four and twenty elders, and like even in Revelation 15 and Revelation 4, it gives a description of this sea of glass, and that um, the Most High sits there at the top of the firmament, and this is where Enoch was taken when he was given vision, and and also shown the description of the motions of the sun and the moon above this flat circular plane, and. I had been reading the book of Enoch since I was 18 years old, but it wasn't until I opened myself to the possibility of understanding that the model of the world was most certainly not this heliocentric worldview that we have all been bought into and that the educational systems have perpetuated. But when I understood that the vision that Isaiah describes in chapter 40 and that Enoch is speaking about as backdrop that the earth is like a clock space and that the sun and the moon move in clockwise circuit above and around the um, the North Pole, the Arctic regions, and that it describes its motion through the six gates of heaven and that the six gates of heaven are spread between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer. And he breaks down in detail how um, the year is broken down also by the two equinoxes and the solstices. And Enoch describes the motion of the sun and the moon through these six gates. He begins on the day of the vernal equinox when the sun is positioned directly above the equator, and he divides the fourth, fifth, and sixth gate from the equator to the Tropic of Cancer, and the first, second, and third gate are from the Tropic of Capricorn to the equator. And in his description of the year in its linear progression, he describes spring beginning on the vernal equinox, and then it takes 30 days for, it, for the sun to traverse between um, moving above the equator through the fourth gate, through the fifth gate, and then reaching the sixth gate at the Tropic of Cancer, it takes the summer solstice for it to reach its summer height and then to reverse course and start moving southward back down through these gates of heaven. And summer solstice begins the first day of summer, and then it takes the 90 days to move down through the sixth, fifth, and fourth gate, reaching the equator on the autumnal equinox, which begins fall, and then it takes 90 days for it to reach the Tropic of Capricorn. And when it reaches the Tropic of Capricorn, uh, the winter solstice, uh, it reverses course, 
and then it begins to move back up towards the equator. And so that's how um, Enoch breaks down the, you know, the progression, the movement of the sun over the course of the year. And he also says that the year is equally divided into 364 days, not 365.14, you know, a quarter like we have the Gregorian um, solar calendars based upon. But he says it's exactly 364 days which is 90 days for each season, and then the one day for the equinoxes and the solstices, and that it exactly breaks down in this particular fashion. And so it's quite fascinating. And then when you apply the description of the movement of the sun and the moon between these six gates of heaven, it completely makes sense um, as it applies to, I don't know if you both have seen um, and how um, Rob Skiba, he breaks down using the stellarium. He's able to show the movement, the circuits of the the sun, both how it has a very short and tight circuit when it's above the Tropic of Cancer, and then a very elongated and wide circuit when it is above the Tropic of Capricorn. It's yeah, a fascinating yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, observations that have been made to support that. Uh, for example, in the southern hemisphere, um, supposedly, I've never been there, but supposedly the uh, twilight phenomenon um, is a much more, like, uh, abrupt. And in the northern hemisphere, right. you know, during, depending on the season, um, the twilight is, you know, sort of lingers around. It, it, it stays around for a lot longer. So, yeah, there, there's definitely not the... Um, like bilateral symmetry that you would necessarily have on a on a globe. So, John, yeah. is, isn't it the opposite? It doesn't it hang around in the southern and short in the northern? Yeah, or do I, I, I might have it backwards. I might have it backwards. Yeah. Don't, no, don't no, it's it. um, <laughs> it is it, it is when the Tropic of Cancer is the the you know the circle that is closest to the Arctic regions, and yep. it does have the tight and it moves slowest because you know the circuit always maintains itself that's, to that's 124 right. hour period and that's right. also where the midnight sun phenomena occurs and you're right as far as the differentiation between the arctic and the antarctic regions like there's you know when the sun is moving slow above the arctic and you can actually see it move in its full circle um, from west to east and then north and back to the east it stays above the horizon for days at a time. Right. But during that time, the tundra thaws because the sun is moving so slow. The tundra thaws, uh, it turns um, into rivers, all these mice, uh, mosses and lichens and everything um, grows, trees bloom, flowers bloom. All of the animals have their gestation and um, cycles as far as becoming pregnant and propagating the the different all of that occurs during this time there's actual you know have been human populations living in the arctic for thousands of years and like in 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 also the seas you know they completely melt during this time but whereas in antarctica during the um when it's above the tropic of capricorn it moves the sun has to move very fast because the revolution is at its widest. And, um, and it's my opinion that there could be no way that the midnight sun phenomena, which is visibly seen and witnessed by many in the Arctic regions, that this kind of thing could also be um, seen in the, I would be surprised because the sun is moving at a faster pace. Right. Um, Jonathan, and, you you were right by the way you, that you had it. It it lingers in the north and it's right. faster in the south. Right. right, and you know one of the things, one of the issues that I've had and, and I've sort of wrestled with is okay. So if we assume that the sun is a physical object, and I, and I think that your description of Enoch is is really impressive and it's very interesting. Um, I have uh, and I and I told you before, but I have read uh, Enoch in the past, and I've just you know, sort of uh, just been looking at it again a little bit here lately as a flat earther. So it's definitely very interesting. But um, one of the things that I've sort of theorized, um, and this doesn't necessarily go against what Enoch was describing, but if you think of uh, 
like if the sun is going around in, in a single circuit and that circuit never changes, if it, and it's constantly going at the same speed, but the angle at which the source of the light is sort of penetrating through the firmament or the electromagnetic fields that sort of layer up above us, and if, if it sort of angles in, you know, towards the northern summer and angles out towards the southern summer, um, but without actually moving, just sort of changing its angle of uh, sort of angle of attack of like, a, I don't know, think of it as like a laser beam instead of a sun, but where that point of the laser beam hits our atmosphere or hits the magnetosphere or whatever, that's where we see the visible sun. I mean, this is just a theory. I'm not saying this is what it is, but it makes a lot of sense to me, and you don't have the issue of the sun um, needing to speed up during the southern summer and slow down during the northern summer. I mean, to me, that's sort of a physical issue. I'm not saying it's not doing that, but I've, you know, does that make sense that um, there's other mm -hmm. things that could be going on that we're not really uh, aware of? I thought yeah. of that, and I, I had another, uh, another explanation of how it could speed up and slow down. Um, I think it's Randy Powell or, or one of those guys shows that if you, if you make a, have a ring magnet and put it over a magnetic capacitor, um, there's natural spin motion in, in that northern pole of, of a ring magnet. So imagine that our center, our north, is a ring magnet. Our sun is a type of capacitor, and it has that spin to it. Um, and that spin, um, it's like, it just imagine you're that magnetic north and you're holding a rope that's 10 feet long and you're swinging it over your head. And that's the spin force. So if you put a, uh, you know, a ball on that rope a foot out from your hand and you put another one out at 10 feet, it's that same spin motion. They're both going 360 degrees in, in each uh, at the same time, but one of them's going uh, a lot faster than the other, but it's the same motion. And perhaps sure. so it's there, right. there's sort of it's sort of riding the same uh magnetic field wave, if you will right and if and that then, wave is running parallel to the uh to the latitude lines right I'm sorry to the longitude lines, if that wave is running like north to south, then yeah i could I totally see what you're saying yeah so so maybe when it gets all the way out to a certain point wherever you know the the strength of that magnetic spin, it says, okay, uh, that's it, I'm gonna slow down, and now I'm gonna swing back in and it comes back in it gets recharged up in the inner northern hemisphere, hemisphere plane and it sends it right back out again and that is a, a reasonable explanation to me as a possibility sure yeah let uh, me um <laughs> share just one passage really quick because um Again, as I was talking about with the, you know, the Book of Enoch, the portion that I'm talking about is called the Book on the Courses of the Heavenly Luminaries. But there was one particular passage that if you try to understand this in uh, applying this whole model to the heliocentric worldview, even if you're looking down at the globe from, um, you know, on the top of the North Pole, it just does not make sense. And this particular passage is uh, chapter 71, verse 8, where it says this. And this was the whole thing that made me understand uh, as far as the movement of the sun. It says this. The sun sets in heaven and returning by the north to proceed towards the east is conducted so as to enter by that gate and illuminate the face of heaven. So the, it's talking about the you know the sun moving from from east to west and then it moves north again and then back to the east. So how how could that uh, occur in a heliocentric model? It just couldn't. But when you understand that Enoch was looking down at the circle of the Earth as if it was a clock face, and then you describe he's describing a circle uh, around the North Pole. And so the 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 sun moves from the south uh, from the east southwest and then north uh, west to where you know it reaches to the west and then it moves northeast and then southeast and it makes this complete circle. Of course, it's doing arcs, but he's basically describing a circular motion to the circuit of the sun. And so it, the only way you can make sense of this portion of the Book of Enoch is when you apply it to the flat earth as model of the world. 
Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I I think it's really interesting because um you know, just the way that he's describing uh obviously the the clockwise motion from looking down on it, that that certainly makes a lot more sense in a flat earth model. And um if I, I sort of tend to think of the the world as almost like a capacitor plate or a giant electromagnet and um you know, there's just energies that are that are generated by the the world's natural magnetic flux lines, and if that if it's that sort of thing that's causing the the celestial bodies, and the celestial bodies are just a symptom of that, or you know, a feature of that, it, it really makes a lot of sense, and and um, there, there's good evidence for it too. I mean, look at uh, all the hot air uh, not hot air balloon uh, weather balloon, super high altitude weather balloon footage, and most of the time you'll see the sun just a couple degrees above the horizon. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty darn close. Um, you know, the Zetetic uh, model has it at less than 4,000 miles up, and that, that certainly makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's, there's a lot of observations that we can make um, from high-altitude flights that show things like, you know, uh, hot spot directly underneath right. the sun all the time, which, you know, the, the thing's just no way 93 million miles away. It's very close. Also with the way that the, and when a sun's going down in the clouds and the rays fan out in all directions, they're not all parallel with one another. Uh, also with the way that we see um, the sunset, the pillar of light reflecting off of the waves of the ocean. And because we'll see it all the way to the point where the sun is uh, as it's reaching the vanishing point, which shows to us that the, the, from where our feet, where we're looking on the, the beach all the way out across the ocean is a completely flat um, surface and that the ocean waves are between us and the sun. Uh, and then there's another phenomenon where sometimes you'll see clouds behind the sun, you know, clouds in front of and behind the sun, and how would that be possible if the sun is 93 million miles away? <laughs> I, I think that sort of thing may be more of an optical illusion, and I, and I have seen some, you know, some of the images and of that and clouds going in front of and behind the moon. Um, and again, I, I think this is sort of owing to like, um, if you think of take a again maybe a laser pointer or even a flashlight. And if you shine, uh, say, a flashlight through a pane glass window and that, that flashlight's beam hits the, the floor, well, you'll see like a circle of light in the pane of glass, but you'll also see a circle of light on the ground. Um, but neither one of them is the actual source of the light. Um, and if you sort of apply that to, you know, think of um, the tip top of our atmosphere or like the lower magnetosphere as a plane of, well, what astronomers would say is a plane of plasma tubes. That's what they've recently imaged. It's plasma tubes up there in the lower magnetosphere, which is about 600 kilometers up. But if that if light is passing through, you know, all of that stuff, then you know it's sort of hard to judge what actually is going on with the sources of the light. If that analogy makes sense. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. I'd like to I'd like to throw a thing in. A lot of people use the uh, you know, hey, we wouldn't see the light going all the way across the ocean to the point of the sun, and and I, I agree that we're looking across a flat plane, but if we were on a ball and the water is curved with that ball, there's a point where we, we can't see past uh, the horizon because it's curved over the horizon. So now the sun is dropping down behind us. You're going to see that light on a ball earth with curved water, which is crazy, from that point um, where you can't see below the, the curve of the water you're going to see that line of sunlight all the way to you, um, and it's going to look like it goes all the way to the sun, but there's a huge gap in there. So right. I don't think that that's really uh, – you can argue it both ways. So I really don't like using that, but uh -huh. you know, with, all, with all of the other evidence, you know – Well, no, actually, if you, if you really do uh, experiment with light, it, that, that effect is only possible if the sun's very close. Um, or at least, you know, where that light's coming from is, is very close. So, again, it, it, it can be sort of sure. misleading. But, um, but yeah, no, the, the, if you look at reflection of a sunset from the ocean or whatever, or sunrise, whichever coast you're on, um, it definitely uh, 
it doesn't look good for the globe, just that one thing alone, because, you know, if the sun's 93 million miles away and the earth is a globe, you, you just, there's no way you can get that effect. Um, the angles are, are all off. If the, the light's all coming in at parallel lines, right? Right. It's just the way. So. The, the, bigger, the bigger proof for me is, uh, real quickly, the, the seasons. You know, um, the, with the tilt of the earth, one of the hemispheres is close, is farther from the, the sun during its summer, and we're told that the seasons are because of the angle. When, uh, you know, if you're on the side of the earth that is tipped towards the sun, um, it's that angle of rays that gives us our summer. Um, well, if that was true... Then, you know, I go out on December 21st here at noon. I stare up at the sun, which is about 50 degrees off the horizon, and I barely feel the heat on my face. I'm freezing. And in the summer, on June 21st, if I watch the sun rise or sun set, I could feel the sun blazing on my face until it disappears past the point of convergence. Um, if, if, uh, if, if the ball model was true and it was the angles, even in the middle of the summer, at sunrise and sunset, it should be Arctic freezing because you're, you're at the most severe angle cutting through the atmosphere. You're at one degree off the horizon, two degrees off the horizon, um, and that little, you know, 23-degree tilt would mean nothing. I mean, it would be absolutely it is, it's freezing. Totally, it's totally vast backwards, and that is politically correct if you think about it because the polar regions should get the most direct sunlight on average because again they're actually supposed to be tilted in towards the sun um every summer each polar region gets its own summer and during that time it's got you know supposedly in the globe earth model it's got direct uh, like the most direct sunlight for half of the year um so yeah it, it's just totally it doesn't make any sense um that the the ice in the center and the ice on the outside if that actually is what it is i've never been to the north pole and i've never been to the south pole either but if we go by you know what we're told um then that makes a lot more sense in the flat earth model yeah well consider that science also says that in january we're actually closer to the sun uh and that when it's summer we're actually um 3 or 4 million miles more extent from the sun so how does that make any you know well they they say it's because of the angle but that angle is literally only you know 30 degrees or whatever it's 23 degrees um but you have to think about that the angle changes throughout the day sunrise and sunset should Mm -hmm. be freezing uh, every day of the year Yeah, it's it's bogus. It doesn't like, you know, when we're told all this stuff and I don't know about you guys, but I was taught all this stuff basically as a toddler. And, you know, once you get into middle school and high school and stuff, sure, you have science class, but it's all just reinforcing, you know, this heliocentric model. Right. And any any arguments that we might have had against this model were basically squashed throughout our upbringing. And, you know, now that we revisit this topic as rational, skeptical scientists as adults um it doesn't make any sense it really doesn't and and the alternate model just uh you know makes so much more sense in every single way it's it's really kind of ironic which is why i think people should instead of just writing it off as complete um being farcical that people should really investigate it and look into it and give it a, a week you know to just try to debunk it because when you do, um, you find out that the rabbit hole just goes even that much further than we ever really in, uh, believed originally. Yeah. Hey, Gemma, I would like to take this conversation in a little different direction, if you're willing. For my research, the reason why we have this heliocentric model is actually it's based on religion, in particular religion of sun worship. It's the only thing that makes any sense to me. And if we look all the um, the past you know, several thousand years, this has been a, a part of humanity and has been part of the ruling elite's religion of worshiping the sun, and they really started pushing this heliocentric model during a time which most people have really spent much time researching on, and I understand because it's a, it's seemingly tedious and a little too religious of an issue, 
I didn't even start studying this stuff myself until a couple of years ago, and that is the Counter Reformation and the Reformation and the Jesuits. That all this stuff happened at the same time, and one of the things that uh, they swore on with this military order, and that's what the Jesuits are. Whether if, if it's just a little bit of research on it, you'll realize it. It's not me being prejudiced or bigoted. They, they actually say they are their military order, <laughs> and it was a Counter Reformation to counter what happened. Whether one wants to believe in the Bible or not, regardless of that, what it did do is it uh, opened up the floodgates and caused the greatest threat to uh, the Roman Empire that's happened in 500 years. And so one of the things they did is through principles like learning against re- learning, the ends justifies the means, etc., to actually push this false model that basically we're saying that is a false model. Now, I'm not saying the low, lower level folks, the middle level folks are doing that, but the higher level folks, the people that are actually in charge and running the satanic system are the ones, they know what they're doing and what this is all about. I just wanted to like to hear your gentlemen's talk on that. By the way, when you talk about the Jesuits too, if one looks at the hierarchical structure of that, they, the black Pope is the lead, that's the head of the, all these secret societies, including the Freemasons. And this is overwhelming evidence for that statement and i've done oh gosh probably hundreds of shows now on this topic so everybody wants to to go back with my many shows and archives about it so but i don't really want to talk too much about that but what i would like to talk about is what's your take on this and why what is the motive that you see for uh this grand deception this lie that focuses basically if we're real honest about it i mean it really is, folks. It's about the sun. I mean, they make of this thing that's huge. It's in the center of everything, right? It's not us. It's this, the sun. Yeah. Why well, is it? I mean, it, anyone who uh, who starts to research, uh, you know, the occult and you know, sort of the secret societies, it, it sort of all leads back to sun worship. Um, you know, look at ancient Egypt. That, uh, as far as we can tell, a big part of their sort of religion or whatever you want to call it was uh, essentially sun worship. Um, if you look at the ancient Greek civilization, um, it was essentially sun worship. And so you have this pattern throughout history of people worshiping the sun. So it's, it's a pretty common thing. Um, but then what, you, what I believe sort of happened was the Roman Catholic Church intermingled uh, Christianity and this sun worshiping cult, which are two totally separate things. But it's sort of like the whole controlled opposition idea where, you know, if you can't fight them, join them. Well, the Roman Catholic Church did an excellent job of essentially commandeering Christianity and and basically ruling it to this very day. Um, But, yeah, so I I definitely agree. I think that this ultimate agenda, you know, uh, they've got the sun, I think, 110 times bigger than the earth. It will all die without the sun. And, And really... It's, if you think about it, it's, uh, heliocentrism is probably the most popular religion in the world because it has all religions really within it. Now, people will have sort of been telling me more recently that the, some Middle Eastern countries don't really push heliocentrism like we think they do. Um, but at the end of the day, I've had Chinese people tell me that I was part of a cult because I thought the earth was flat. So, the, you know, heliocentrism <laughs> is pretty widespread. And, yeah, I definitely agree. I think that's exactly what they've done. I think it's a big part of the motive. Um, I think the other part of the motive is to sort of uh, – it's, it's a psychological prison for our minds. The globe is, that, uh, you know, that is. Um, but, yeah, totally agreed. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, son? What is your take on that? Um, I, I'm going to read just two paragraphs that I wrote in my book specifically about this particular topic. Uh, It says this, when I first woke up to the revelation that we live on a flat earth, I was initially blown away by the thought of how monumental a task it must have been for those in league with the heliocentric conspiracy capacity to pull it off and perpetuate it for so long. I just couldn't wrap my mind around how much necessary effort would have had to have been put forth in order to usurp the then belief in geocentric worldviews. How many lies had to have been told, how many bribes made, in order to overthrow and secure in one fell swoop the agreement of the then scientific establishment? I mean, this is a massive deception of, quote, 
global scale involving many nations of people, how many of the most well-respected, historically recognized and celebrated scientific minds had to have been willing to uh, accomplices in order for them to achieve the results that they did in leading astray the whole world. Now, here's where it gets to the Masonic part. How does one even begin to grasp the entanglement of so many in what was coup d'etat and crowning achievement for Lucifer as sun god in his efforts to be like the Most High? Because remember it says in Isaiah, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. In the sides of the north I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. The demotion of the earth as the preeminent focus of God's universe to that of just another one of the planetary subjects comprising the solar system was such a perfectly orchestrated hoax. It set the foundation for the latter acceptance of Darwinism and belief that man evolved from some ape-like ancestor. Science as religion has separated people from inherent belief in intelligent design and knowledge that we share a special covenant with the creator being made in his image as crowning achievement of the creation he established for us to believe in all things having just come about as random chance without necessary involvement from some grand designer. Dumbfounded, I have been trying to understand why more so than how they were able to do it. I'll just stop there. David, you want to comment on that? I agree with with all of that. You know, the 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 big picture is they're just trying to um, keep us in a state of fear, disconnected from our power, uh, disconnected from who we truly are. You know, if if everybody knew um, the truth and of who we really are, they would have no power over us. The only way they can do that is keep us in fear, um, which disconnects us from our power, disconnects us from God, and you know, if we believe that we're in a speck flying through the, you know, through the infinite cosmos with other specks out there, um, we don't think about God. I never thought about God my whole life. I mean, I tried to, but I just never really believed it. Um, and I was brainwashed, you know, on all the garbage they teach us in school. And just by discovering the flat earth, um, I have changed everything. And you know what? You know why people don't run traffic lights when there's a uh, camera on the, on the light is because they know they're being watched, so everyone just behaves just a little bit better. So imagine if everyone discovered the flat earth and realized there was a God and just behaved just a little bit better. Um, we'd live in a whole new world. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Point well, well taken. Well you, know, you know, I got a question here to, the, to add on to this and go to uh, – maybe a deeper, more philosophical and psychological um, uh, well, look at this whole issue. Because coming to the realization that I have and the, the, the rest of you gentlemen on the show tonight, that is the heliocentric model is just total bonk. There's, just, there's nothing to support it. Um, and that uh, we have somehow been conditioned to believe in a whole bunch of fables and fairy tales. And it, uh, certainly this has come across your minds numerous times is how did we get to this point? How has humanity as a whole, uh, why are we so uh, easily deceived? Why do we buy into so many of the lies? Now I understand we talked a little bit about, uh, Dave talked a little bit about fear and all that, but um, and, and I think that's – I agree. That's just a big part to that. But another thing there's just – you know, how do we get to – how did we get to this point where we deny our senses, we deny what's right in front of us, that we're willing to accept circumstances that really are detrimental or to our disadvantage as a group? I mean, it really is uh, – this issue, I'm sure all, all four – the rest of you – you, the other three of you have thought about the implications of this topic and how it affects everything, everything. And it, if it were to take root, 
and it would to uh, uh, spread like wildfire. That this would cause humanity to really question all the institutions that enslaved us over the many hundreds, if not thousands, of years. So, I don't know. Have you thought much about the psychological aspects of this? The the uh, cultural, social aspects of this. How do we get to this point? Why, why are we so easily deceived? We're too trusting. Yeah, I, I think it's a grander plan. You know, the the people that are deceiving us um, really know um, the truth, and they they they're they're deceiving us. They're drugging us. They're poisoning us. You know. They're doing everything that they can to dumb us down, you know, and don't, don't, you know, believe that fluoride is for your teeth. You know, we all know that fluoride <laughs> dumbs us down. And I mean, that is no, that's no uh, conspiracy. You know, that's, that's the truth. Um, you know, that and, and all the other stuff they're spraying in the air and all the pharmaceuticals and all of the frequencies on television and Wi-Fi. I mean, you can just keep adding it on, you know, and basically, you know, everyone that I see out there, they're just going from paycheck to paycheck. They're working, you know, so they can drink on the weekend and want, go to a movie and be programmed even more, you yeah. know, and I, and I look at their lives and, I, and I'm just like, wow, they have no idea what's going on. And they're literally rats in a cage. Yeah. Right? I I think psychologically some people and, and, and probably most people or a lot of people are, are just simply unable to ask those questions and to, to actually face the, the implications of, you know, okay, well, if this is the case, if the earth is a stationary plane, then that means, you know, most of what I know has been a lie or a misunderstanding just regurgitated back at me from somebody who wasn't lying you know, all, all our teachers weren't lying, but it's just for some people, they're, they're, it's just impossible for them to face the implications of what this means. And it, and it actually, I think it also is sort of uh, is an insult to people's in, intelligence because um, they don't want to think that they were so gullible to miss something so obvious. Um, but but that is that's the case. And so psychologically, I, I think it's a good thing. Um, to, to me, I've had, uh, you know, it's been very liberating and I've, I've experienced some health benefits just psychologically knowing that, you know, we're not on a spinning globe flying around. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, it, it takes a certain type of person to look at this. And, and that's why, you know, it's so important to me. Um, uh, you know, I've been called crazy more than once, but uh, it's, it's just so simple and, and important uh, that people just take another look at this thing, you know, uh, just question some of these assumptions and, and it actually, a lot of things start to make sense and, and you start to see things uh, differently and, and you certainly see NASA differently. <laughs> There's an amazing, amazing quote. I forget who said it. It says it's easy to fool somebody, but it's almost impossible to convince them they've been fooled. Um, you know, people don't like uh, change that wrecks their paradigm. You know, people, you know, spend their lives learning stuff. And then when they when you find out that it's all lies, um, that's painful. You know, we, we, we're, we're, the government is literally the big, our big parents, the parents of the United States family, that's our government. And when you find out that our government is really not out here for our good, that's too painful. And people don't like dealing with emotional pain like that. So they re will refuse to look. Right. I'll share with you four lines that I wrote about this. The grand deception as matrix is all encompassing, consuming, and broad reaching, yet so covert in imposition it is largely unnoticed. And the whole thing as far as the Matrix movies, I mean, really, that's what we're born into. We're spoon fed um by our parents, by the establishment, the educational system, the religious institutions, the political system our TVs, our movies, our books, our culture, everything reinforces certain mindset and certain beliefs. And things like this, you know, the heliocentric worldview, we never even second guess it. We never even question it. There are so many things that are similar. The whole thing as far as like fluoride, the vaccines, trusting government, trusting the doctors, we trust our school teachers, we trust our parents our grandparents to teach us truth. We trust everything 
um, to teach us what is real. But the real thing about all of that is most of it is based upon lies, a matrix of deceit that is perpetuated in order to lead us into a certain mindset, into acting a certain way, behaving a certain way, go get your education, become good taxpayers, work till you're 65 and too worn out, and um, then you can finally enjoy life, you know. And we all buy into this. We buy into the materialism, the nine-to-five dream. And unless you wake up to the paradigm and realize that we've been lied to and you can break that programming, most people will follow that exact tactic, that exact scheme uh, without ever awakening. They'll be a zombie from the time that they're born to the time that they die, and they will never know different. Well, and it's even people that are wide awake. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Red Silver Jay. He does a lot of stuff on YouTube. Uh, Team Wake Him Up. He's done a lot of really great videos, and I, I've followed, sort of followed his stuff for a long time. He's just very, uh, very funny, and he touches on a lot of, uh, you know, uh, sort of conspiratorial issues. But he's he's right on the money so much. But um, just yesterday, I watched a video that uh, he sort of covered. And it was just because of a conversation I had the other day. Um, he was covering, you know, Tia Tequila has sort of come out as a flat earther, which is kind of, you know, big news because she has a, a pretty huge following. Right. Um, but he was basically calling her, coming up with all these reasons why she was crazy and why she was a paid shill because she's coming out with this flat earth nonsense. And, you know, that's what we're programmed to do. I mean, it's programming. And if you actually, you know, if you never take the time to consider it, then, you know, us people sitting on this call are always going to be crazy nutbags who think the earth is flat. Right. So that, that, and I'm sorry to put it that, that way, but that's what they think. Um, but, you know, to me, it's, it's, uh, it's very frustrating, but it's also sort of comical if you think about it because of how dead wrong they are. Um, but we can't, you know, we've all sort of been there. It's, it's amazing. I mean, I agree with you, man. It's amazing that they pulled this off for so long, um, whether it's hundreds of years. I mean, who knows? It's been going on quite a while. Um, but, you know, it's almost like they have to, to start teaching us this and indoctrinating us into this model at such a young age because they know that if you believe something your whole life and nobody ever tells you different, then you're just going to keep believing it. I mean, that's it, it's self-reinforcing sort of. Do you know how they pulled it off for so long? What you know, the the people that uh, I'll put quotation marks around that that are that are hiding this from us, whether they're the Jesuits, the Luciferians, or whatever you want to call them, the Vatican, whoever it is, um, they didn't do it on their own. This system was designed by God for us not to know um, that it's flat. You know, it was designed so we would we couldn't see God and, and that's really not that hard to like, Hey, look at this system that was built for us. We could take advantage of this and keep everybody in the dark. It's not like they created everything. It was really built to be hidden from us. That's my thought. This leads me to something that I wanted to ask you guys too, but uh, here's um, a comment too that uh, just on what we've been talking about. Few will latch on to anything that challenges or contradicts foundational belief, choosing to cling to false illusion so long as either it is majority opinion or someone they admire perpetuates lie. Which brings me to, you know how so many people say that this is a PSYOP or that the CIA put this all out? Um, it's, I, I think about it like this. How and why would they do that? Because this totally does not benefit them in any kind of way because it's coming to the flat earth as revelation of world. It totally destroys the whole Darwinian heliocentric worldview and also the next slide that they're going to be perpetuating that uh, as far as strong delusion that the ancient aliens are our creators and that in you know, in in my mind, why would they do that? Because it doesn't benefit them. And because so many people tell me, oh, it's just a psyop and that you're just believing all that and it's making Christians look foolish or stupid or whatever. But again, it doesn't benefit them. It actually benefits the most high. 
and it it shows to us that indeed that um, this is a grand uh, design system, and that it also verifies the veracity of the the scriptures, and that they were divinely inspired because uh, not only the Bible but the Book of Enoch have encoded within it as far as the gospel, this revelation of the earth being flat, uh, of a circular plane, and that, um, you know, and, and if that is true, and the scriptures are divinely inspired and prophetic in that manner, then the other things that it asserts, that God created the earth as foundation for the firmament, and that the firmament, the heavens were spread out and fitted to it, and then the sun and the moon and the stars and the heavenly luminaries were placed into that firmament on day four, that we were created in the image of the, the creator, that we share special covenant with him, and that um, that the earth was specially created for us as place of habitation. All of those things, in my opinion, are mind-blowing, and especially like even... I heard your interview, David, with uh, Rob Skiba and the very last seven minutes of that interview where you were talking about how you were a militant atheist before coming to knowledge about these things. And for a lot of Christians, this may not be a salvation issue, but you think of all of the people that have been led astray and that have been separated from God because of belief and, you know, the Darwinian heliocentric model and the perpetuation that everything just came about as random circumstance and everything just evolved to be as it is and that there's all these millions and even billions of earths out there that happen to be uh, perfectly extent and in these Goldilocks zones and that they will also replicate life in the same manner as occurred here. All of that gets thrown out the window when you come to this understanding. And so if it can bring individuals even like yourself to, you know, question the relevancy of is there a grand designer? And to me, that absolutely um, is a salvation issue for individuals like yourself because it brings you to really consider whether there is a God and whether we truly do share covenant with him. And that in my mind, is the the biggest thing that could happen for somebody that totally um, did not believe and wasn't even open to the possibility. Can you comment on that, David? Um, it was it was a, a, an amazing awakening for me. I mean, if you told me six months ago that I'd be sitting here on a show talking about how the Earth is flat and how God created it. I would say you were absolutely crazy and I'd probably never talk to you again, but you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, um, it's so clear. And, and, and it's not that I was looking for something, you know, it's not that I was needing something, um, you know, trying to make up something to make myself feel good. I, I felt good. You know, I was suffering Stockholm syndrome like everyone else in this prison. Um, <laughs> but we don't realize it because everyone else is doing it. Hey, everyone else is doing it. You know, it, it, it's amazing how people will react like everybody else. You've seen the, the, the thing where they have a, a room full of actors and one person's not an actor. And then like a guy in the hallway falls off a ladder and is screaming in pain or a fire alarm goes off and everyone ignores it. And so does, you know, so does the real, the real person. It's like, oh, no one else is getting up. I guess I'm not getting up. And uh, that's the world that we live in. Um, right. So, I would like to share a little bit of my insights as well. My, some of my studying and research re- recently. If you look at the uh, early history of uh, Christianity in the early, you know, the first century, second century Christians, and even the Jews, um, you know, uh, one of the biggest problems for the Roman Empire was when people took literal the teachings of what we call Jesus Christ or Yahshua the Messiah, the only begotten of the Father, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt love thy neighbor, thou shalt love thy enemy. It became a real problem 
You see, because what happens is you become a – if you're a person who starts believing in God, you become peculiar to the world because really in truth, the majority will, regardless of what they say, behavior says otherwise that they really don't, that they really don't believe that there's actually a, 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 a God that's a creator that has a design for us and is paying attention to our behavior and all that kind of thing. So you see what happened in the, those first two centuries in which in, if you look at the Jewish wars and the, the Christian persecution and what happened to the Roman Empire and what actually caused its a significant cause of its downfall was this. Uh, this fact, this, this mentality, a change in people where they, they've they started to believe in the creator more than the the empire. And the empire knows this. And we've been living on the same empire for thousands of years. And I don't know if you gentlemen realize the significance of the threat of this issue to the Roman Empire. This is why they would never – this is, cannot be a psychops because – they have memories. Those who pay attention to pay attention to history, and if you're going to be in leadership positions, you're going to have to pay attention to history. You're going to know that this whole notion that if your people start believing in, uh, that there's a God and there's accountability and that you're going to choose to have your accountability uh, under your creator instead of the state – it's going to cause severe problems. And if you must be honest about let's just be honest. Is the history of uh, Christianity, when it married itself with the state, is horrendous. The truth of the matter is, if we look at all the colonization, the hundreds, if not billions of people that have been slaughtered over the past couple thousand years, we have to be honest about this. Is because the state corrupted the teachings of God, corrupted the people, and put the state before God. That is the problem. And when you marry uh, God, if you will, a state, which really is a Luciferian system, only evil happens. We have history to prove that. We have the deaths not only the prophets and saints, but if we look at the, the Bible, it says specifically of all the slain upon the earth. Now, whether you believe it or not, that's one thing, but if you start studying your history, you're going to realize this is the case. And so when you look at the, magnif the magnitude of this issue, is so much greater and deeper than even the fact of what our world looks like. Is what could possibly happen if it takes hold and catches fire. So this is why I recognize how severe or how drastic this issue is and what it could possibly cause. And I think God's behind all this. I really do. I really. I don't think it's a state. I don't think it's a psych op, uh, uh, operation. I, there might be. There might be government elements in it to confuse the issue. But hopefully, people come to the bigger issue, which is that that there is a creator, there's an intelligent designer, that there's something greater than us, and that maybe we ought to think more about that creator, you know what I mean? And, it, you know, like, the truth of the matter is from my own observation, myself and others, there are times in a man's life, no matter how moral, no matter, no matter how great his integrity is, it will fail him. There are situations where even the greatest of men has to lean to something greater than themselves if they are to keep their integrity and do what's right. It's just the way life is. It's just the way human nature is. And so I think that's something that one should think about. And I don't know if you thought about it, and I would like to hear your comments about what I just said. If you know what's, know what's uh, amazing about that is, you know, I'm listening to what you're saying, and it's fascinating to me right now. But uh, six months ago, if I was, I, I, I was, I'm an avid, you know, podcast listener. I'm always researching everything. And I'll, I'll listen to all different shows. And as soon as they mention God, I'm switched off. I'm out in a second. I'm like, okay, they're going down that path. And I switch shows. And now that I've discovered the flat earth, as soon as they mention God, I'm like, well, hold on. What are they saying? And I stop multitasking. Um, so I'm always a little bit cautious about how much I discuss it because I don't want to scare away people like myself, like I used to be. Um, and so we all do our part, you know, like 
like this show right here, you, you know, this is a little heavier on the on the creator side, and I love it, and it's great, and people will find their way to this show. And, and the more guy, uh, Jonathan, he he does different types of videos than I do, and that attracts, you know, people that are in that style. So um, I'm, I'm bearing off subject a little bit, but the, the whole God thing now is what attracts me to it the most, um, but other people – might not feel that way. So I try to balance it out. Well, and, you know, to, to put things in perspective, what I always try to do is compare the two models. So, okay, looking at the heliocentric model, they, they say that everything came from, so the entire universe, this, you know, we're in, thinking of billions and billions of, or trillions of light years across, was all from nothing. All compressed into the area the size of the head of a pin or the size of a golf ball or whatever, which exploded. And we live on basically a chunk of an explosion. So perfect sense. From, from that, you know, we just so happen to have the right chemical composition. And somehow we got DNA out of mud. Um, and you know, right. me, there, there was always this issue of, you know, if you look at DNA as a code, which it absolutely is, um, or at least that's what it appears to be, is it's a code. Um, you, can't, you just simply can't have a code without a coder. And so really the, the whole model just doesn't, really it doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, it's just uh, if you ask someone a question about something, they'll just give you sort of a non-answer that, that might make sense on a sort of uh, uh, surface level. But if you really dig into the explanation, they really don't. It, it doesn't make sense. Um, but if you look at the same question in, in the flat earth model, yeah, I think um, the, the possibility for a grand designer becomes all the more real. Um, it's not just something theoretical that, uh, you know, people have faith in. Uh, based on the King James Bible, which is, uh, you know, I, I think it's still a good tool, but I think there are some misrepresentations in there. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if it takes us closer to Christ, uh, Yeshua, Hermeshiach, then to me, that's that's really what's important. Um, and, you know, so much the scientific, uh, secular scientific world tends to, uh, you know, disprove the whole Christian Bible or the whole uh, – you know, Hebrew and Christian Bible, uh, page one, book one in Genesis, you know, it describes uh, definitely not a spinning globe. And uh, people will point to this as proof that the Bible was basically contrived. But when you actually look at this and you realize, you come to this realization that the earth is actually a stationary plane, then just all of this stuff starts to make so much more sense. It answers so many more questions. Um, it also raises a lot of questions. But, um, you know, it, it's such a beautiful thing. I mean, it's so simple. It explains so many things. And, and that's why I've sort of latched onto it right off the bat, because it answers a million questions that we have that, you know, sort of linger around with the heliocentric model. Um, and, and, you know, people are just unable to look at it because of uh, psychological uh, pretension, basically, pre-programming. And it's uh, very, very powerful. But I, I think, you know, eventually, to answer your question, I think eventually uh, one day it, it will sort of uh, get to the critical mass that we need to where, um, you know, it sort of explodes, uh, for lack of a better word. But um, until then, you know, to me, it's, it's just so nice finally knowing something for sure. And I don't need explanations for every last detail. Um, you, you know, heliocentrism doesn't answer every last detail. It only pretends to. Um, right. But with this awareness, uh, to me, it's just so many questions are answered. And I've had some of my listeners, one of my listeners told me specifically about her husband used to be an astrophysicist. He was an atheist, hardcore atheist, um, totally bought into, believed in the Darwinian heliocentric worldview that we evolved of apes and that, you know, that there's many Earths out there and they are all, um, randomly DNA is just, as you said, coming out of, uh, out of the ground, out of the mud. And just, we evolved from fish and came out of the oceans. And then somehow man came to be what it is. And that this kind of thing is replicating itself as process out there in the universal system many times over, even right now. Um, but for her husband, when he did come to this realization and, and he actually began to study and to read the scriptures. He embraced that there was a God. And they, she told me that they left. They moved out of the United States. They moved to Belize, got, the, um, got a little place down there to where they're 
now opening a little guest house. And he's, uh, even though he still has a love and a fascination for the stars, he doesn't want to be in the world of academia anymore. He doesn't want to, because he was teaching lies. You know, he was perpetuating the whole, um, the whole story, the whole same thing, all of those lies upon lies. And he didn't want to propagate that system anymore. So he left and changed his whole worldview, his whole understanding, his whole perspective, and their whole lives have changed just because of this as revelation. And for me, the capacity that this as um, a knowledge and understanding has for totally turning a person's life upside down, in especially for those that are you know, scientific academia background, uh, PhD degrees, and have committed themselves to you know, st- uh, teaching as professors. Um, so many individuals um, have been completely turned upside down in their lives. Instead of their, you know, the world being upside down, the world was made flat, and they, because of this knowledge, everything for them has changed completely and that is what is the most amazing thing to me about this knowledge this information that it can change somebody you know as david was saying from being militant atheist to unfriending you if you were you know somebody that believed in god and um in a, a grand designer i mean that to me is just what is so awesome because the scriptures talk about and in the last days, even the book of Enoch says that it would be written for a remote generation, a distant age. And it also says in Joel and other places that the spirit would be poured out on all flesh and that we are seeing those things come to light, um, that nothing would be hidden, everything would be revealed. And so it's my opinion that this is one of the key components for revealing truth to the masses in that at some point there is going to be a critical mass and more and more people are going to embrace this. Um, It's still my opinion that the elect and those that will, you know, fully come to understanding of this, that the masses will still, the majority will um, totally not buy into it and believe that it's not worthy of their time or worthy of their study but that there will be many and many will be reached and it will impact and affect a lot of people's lives. And that um, because of that, many people will be introduced to God for the first time. Yeah. Well, you know, it's so funny because I, one thing I've been sort of thinking about doing and it, and it takes a lot more uh, guts than you think. Um, but I, I've been sort of thinking about uh, printing up some, some top 10 flat earth fact flyers and just like, uh, randomly ambushing people like in the the city here with <laughs> right and stuff and and uh, putting it up on YouTube, um, but not so much to put it up on YouTube, but just to get random people involved in or at least looking at this. And and I think it's going to take something like that because, you know, we can only reach so many people with social media. Um, there are a lot of people plugged into social media, but they tend to you know people that are really plugged into social media tend to stick with social media. And um, if we can get more people that are, you know, just average people on the street um, looking at this, I think that's going to, you know, lead to exponential growth faster than, than social media can. I mean, it's great in some ways, and in other ways it's not so great connecting with everybody. So just one, one thing I've been thinking about doing, and I, I definitely have the, the guts to do it. Um, I'm just I, – I think I'm more waiting on the weather to, to warm up a little bit. <laughs> Right on. I think that would be an interesting show, you know, like if you were just, if you took a video or had somebody videotaping um, your uh, uh, discourse, your conversations with people, I think that would be fascinating and that you would um, reach a wider audience even on your, uh, the the Morgal, um, the YouTube, your website. Yeah, I I think it would be any of us, you know, doing that. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think it would be interesting to watch. Not so much fun to make. I might get punched in the face, but, uh, yeah, I think <laughs> something like that because, um, you know, eventually it has to be done. And, and um, this is the sort of thing where, you know, I've had people come to me and say that they've, you know, gone to their, you know, to their pastor with this and literally been institutionalized for it. So, 
um, it's something that when people come to this realization, they get very passionate about it. And, and so I would just, you know, use that as a tale, a cautionary tale, uh, because it's not just, you know, one person either. I mean, this does happen from time to time where people want to sort of express this to people that they know and care about, and it ends up sort of backfiring on them because, again, um, you know, I, I hate to, to abuse the, the analogy of the matrix, but um, it really is a good analogy because these, a lot of people are still plugged into this very system, and it's just so hard to, to get on this level um, because so many assumptions are involved. I mean, it, it's really just mind-boggling. Um, but sometimes it just takes, you know, just someone to look at this and, and realize that there's a discussion to be had, and that's all it takes. So, right. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I, I don't know if um, – tell me how you feel if you want to keep going on. I would certainly like to. I, I There's – Zen brought up stars, and inevitably with this journey of the flat earth and looking at the um, – what is above us, what are stars? Why is – what is on the other side of the dome? I know this is, could be – most likely speculations, but but then again, we are starting to think more, and uh, we're getting imagery, a video from independent sources, demonstrating that the star, the stars, or what those luminaries in the sky are something different than uh, what they have actually been told. I don't know. Would you like to address that? I, I, I'll jump in. Okay. Um, my current belief is that all of the luminaries we see in the sky, <clears throat> and that includes the stars, the wandering stars that we call planets, and the other things that we call the International Space Station and satellites. Um, you know, some are aircraft and other stuff, you know, that we don't know about. But um, these are things that have orbital path, orbital, is that a word? Paths, um, just like the planets. The wandering stars have orbitable paths, and there are energetic, maybe sentient luminaries that are literally the projector of our holographic world that we live in. I used to laugh at astrology, um, but it's so intense if you really look at what they're talking about. And, uh, you know, I, w I would laugh at it, but astrology is the real science, and astronomy is the made up science. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, everything is backwards that, you know, for real, it, it, it's amazing. You know, they teach us in school, they teach us mathematics, but they teach us the garbage mathematics, the basic stuff. They don't teach us sacred geometry and vortex mathematics. I know I've said this on other shows. I don't know if you guys have heard it, <clears throat> but those are the true, um, you know, the true uh, languages of, our world that we live in and, and that would give you great knowledge. Um, so I, I just think that all of those luminaries that we see in the sky do affect us, you know, when we're born and where we are and, and the, the, the relationships to each other um, <clears throat> have a direct effect on our life. You know, I used to say, you know, how could where this rock is in space affect me in any way, shape or form? It made no sense. But now that I know, that it's not a rock, um, you know, there's something very sacred and powerful up there above us. You know, and, and to, prove, to prove that these, these luminaries in the sky affect you, just think about uh, people's moods when there's a full moon or when there's a bright, right. sunny day with a blue sky versus an overcast, chemtrail-filled day. Um, that changes your mood. It changes your energy level. It changes who you are, you know. And, uh, you know, just by looking at the sun, um, you, get, you gain vitamin D in your eyes. And, you know, like if you sun gaze, uh, uh, and I highly recommend that people ground themselves and sun gaze at sunrise and sunset, um, my vision gets better when I, when I sun gaze. You know, I don't wear glasses, but things get a little blurry for me sometimes. If I sun gaze for a few days, my eyesight goes back to perfect. Um, and, and there's energies that we just don't understand you know people get sick in the winter because the sun has gone away and we're not getting our our vitamin d so our body starts regenerating cells in our lungs and stuff and 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 trying to protect itself because it's not getting um what it needs from these luminaries in the sky that that affect our life on every level 
Yeah. Um, one one theory that I've been looking into a little bit in terms of the stars uh, it has to do with um, cymatics or more specifically like um, sonic luminescence. Yeah, which, yeah. Which is a thing, and uh, yeah, it, it sort of goes really nicely with the idea that you know that God actually spoke everything into existence, which right. is sort of a, a theory that I've been really uh, sort of more and more leaning towards. Uh, but if you look at the stars in the, the sonic luminescence sense that's one thing but on the other hand i remember a few years ago my you know research sort of stumbling upon this idea or this uh anomaly that a lot of these major earthquakes all over the world were sort of coinciding with different celestial events and different uh planetary alignments so yeah i tend to agree that there uh there there seems to be some effects uh here in reality on the physical plane here on the ground uh there seems to be some sort of uh, relationship between us and the the solar plane or the cosmic plane or whatever you want to call it. So, um, but yeah, that's that's very interesting. I'm actually hey, glad hey. that you brought that up. Go ahead, David. And I'll John, I, I, um, the the YouTuber Flatwater um, I put out a series. Or he was reading a book. I forget the name of it. Um, and he mentioned in it, and I had heard it somewhere else that um, in ancient times and, and maybe even in, in current times that certain, under certain conditions, when you look at the constellations, that they could actually see <clears throat> some sort of connection um, to all of the stars, you know, like fibers or energetic pathways connecting the constellations. And, and then that's how you can tell that oh, this constellation of stars creates this pattern. Have you, have you heard of that or, or seen any evidence of it? No, but that's uh, fascinating. I, I I'm not sure I understood the the question, or I, I'm not sure I understood what you were describing. I'm sorry. You want to Crickets. say it again, Dave? <laughs> well, I think he was saying like uh, the different stars, you know, the constellations, and how they form the, you know, the the lion, uh, the Big Dipper, um, that there's loose connections between them, like filaments of um, uh, starlight or something, maybe, that um, give them the appearance uh, as far as uniting these constellations in that way, uh, which I haven't heard, and I'm not sure of the flat water video that David is talking about, but... Yeah, I, I haven't seen that either. And, you know, one thing that, that's my understanding, and this could be way off, you know, who knows, but it's my understanding that in order to navigate uh, navigate upon the seas, you sort of have to have constellations so that you know what stars you're looking at. Otherwise, it just looks like a mess of stars. Right. But you can, you know, if you assign certain patterns, um, they're, that if you can position those patterns, then you'll be able to navigate with the stars. Um, and it seems like that's where the astro- astrological configurations developed in ancient times, and we, you know, we still have them today. Um, right. It's pretty good proof against the heliocentric model in and of itself. Uh, yeah. but that's that's my understanding. But you know, there could be more to it, of course. Uh, but you know, I'm not sure. Well, there's a in, in if you really study the scriptures too, there's a thing called the Maseroth, uh, which is a reference to the constellation, and the the constellations the story is that they actually and you know these do go back to very ancient times but they actually tell of the virgin birth and the coming of messiah the different the each one of the 12 constellations that the full story of all of them together talks about the yeshua being born of a virgin how he would come as messiah he would crush the head of the serpent there would be the war between the enmity, the between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, um, and that you know because uh, the Genesis three fifteen, the enmity between these two seed lines, that the seed of the woman would crush the the head of the seed of the serpent, and the seed of the serpent would nip at the heel of uh, Yeshua. All of that is written into the stars, and so it actually tells the story of the New Testament gospel which is amazing in itself. But um, one thing I wanted to comment on in what you were talking about with the the sound waves and the frequencies, and there was a video um, which shows when you enter um, 
sound frequencies into a bubble that is in a water medium that the wa- the bubble will collapse and, and collapse so violently that it will create light and it has a sacred geometric pattern which for those the um that know what I'm talking about just recently there have been a, a number of videos put out where individuals have focused in with high power telescopes on different planets or different stars and they show these kind of sacred geometric wave patterns of these uh it's like a light frequency similar to what happens when you enter you know this um this wave sound frequency into this air bubble and it generates this light and that these stars the heavenly luminaries even the wandering stars that they depict the same pattern as what one can see and um and witness when these sound waves are also entered into that same kind of medium and so uh it which also led me to the thing as far as yeshua being the word and that there's a book called the Sefer Yetzara, which is um, a very ancient text, and it was supposedly one of the books given to Adam when he was banished from paradise. And it talks about how Yeshua, the Word, sang the universe into being, sang the creation into being. And so if the, you know, because it also talks about in Genesis that there are waters above the firmament and waters below, and that possibly the stars as these heavenly luminaries are in this watery, you know, the waters above, they're housed and um, they are these sound waves, these sacred geometric patterns playing out in these um, waters above. And that's why we see them reflected in the patterns that we do, which makes sense to the, the word that you said, the, schematics or whatever um as far as this particular scientific uh which shows the propagation of um of light in this watery medium uh, it's fascinating uh, i'll look up the video and post it into skype so well it's it's funny because you know if you look at the whole uh molecular theory or the theory of atoms it, it's almost like they put little solar systems inside of everything um but if you if you look at things differently um, first of all, nobody's ever imaged an atom, so it's all very theoretical where you have, you know, electrons spinning around. Um, it could be something similar with, you know, this uh, valence electron still working in theory um, and that sort of thing still working in theory, but being totally different than a little, you know, basically a little solar system being an atom. Um, and instead of looking at it like that, I'm looking at things in terms of different frequencies, um, which is something that, uh, you know, Nikola Tesla was very, uh, very much a proponent for. And um, it's just, you know, things make a lot of sense if you think about them in terms of different frequencies. And um, I, right. I don't think it should be any different in the astral plane or the, you know, where the celestial bodies reside. I think it's probably something uh, or it's possibly something similar going on there where you've got, uh, you know, basically, uh ethereal matter uh, forming around the different wave patterns that exist up there. I mean, it, there could be lots of different explanations, but uh, yeah, the stars are a big mystery. Uh, one thing's for sure, there's no way they could be, you know, trillions of miles or thousands of light years away. That's just, there's no way light could tra- travel that far. And, uh, you know, another thing I've been thinking about as well, you know, sunlight has this characteristic that moonlight doesn't, that sunlight and moonlight are two very totally different things. Right. Uh, we can maybe get into that a little bit, but one of the main things that I've been sort of uh, thinking about is uh, sunlight causes the sky to, to be blue and light up like a sapphire so you can't see the stars. But uh, when the sun's gone, it's not a, you know around you anymore, we can see all the stars you know basically clear as a bell as long as it's a clear day. So with all that starlight, you know, why doesn't our atmosphere turn blue? Um, and, it, you know, when you think about it, it just really, it, it goes along with the flat earth model much better than it does the, the globe earth model because our atmosphere responds to light differently, you know, sunlight differently than it does moonlight. Um, I still think there's a, there an argument to be had whether the moon is self-luminescing or whether it's reflecting light, but 
it, you know, it goes through phases, which is sort of confusing. And so do the wandering stars um, seem to go through similar phases as the moon. Um, so there, there seems to be two different types of things up there. Like the moon is almost more of a physical thing where the stars and the sun may be, you know, not so physical. Who, who knows? Uh, it's still very much up in the air. Well, as far as the moon reflecting the sun's light, um, I don't see how that could be because the properties of the moon of moonlight is completely different from that of sunlight. You know, whereas um, sunlight, you can actually magnify it and create fire, and it will burst into a flame. When you magnify moonlight and then focus it on something, it actually reduces the temp the temperature. And then it's also been proven experimentally and scientifically that um, the properties of moonlight can be detrimental um, if, if people don't get enough, you know, vitamin D and to, uh, as far as sun to balance that out. And if you only get moonlight, it can actually uh, drive one. It, it ca causes detrimental effects on like animals that are only exposed to moonlight. And, uh, and so the properties would have to be similar, in my opinion, if um, the moon were reflecting sunlight and how there's this differentiation just doesn't make sense to me if, um, if it is indeed reflecting sunlight. So talking about the distance, uh, light traveling a distance, the sun is 97 million miles. We'll call it 100 million miles away from us. And it's this giant, giant thing, and it looks really small in the sky because it's 100 million miles away. Well, the nearest star is 4 million, uh, four light years away, light years. Right. The sun yeah. is, is, is light minutes, a couple light minutes away, right? Uh, imagine if the sun was just twice the distance that it is. We wouldn't be able to see it. It would be gone. I mean, so is there a point in space where, all right, it's already this small, it's never going to get any smaller no matter how far you put it? I mean, if you really think about that, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. If the sun was three times the distance, let's just say that, you wouldn't see it. Right. Yeah, I, right? I agree. And this, this is all, all those distances are, are of course, theoretical, but right. yeah, of course. And, you know, another thing too, look at uh, Jupiter, for example, Jupiter's actually supposedly uh, further away than the sun. Um, and, and, you know, you can see Jupiter in, and actually detect its moons with the naked eye, apparently, which is like, how is that possible? Um, the, the sun is supposedly about 93 million miles away from us. And uh, Jupiter is supposedly three times that distance. And you have to go basically on a plane through the asteroid belt, um, which is all these points are on the same plane, the, the sun, the Earth, and uh, Jupiter. The, in, in the heliocentric model, it's, it's called the solar plane. It's the orbital plane. And it's just impossible that you could see these you know, little tiny 365 million mile away planet through the asteroid belt. It's just so ridiculous. Um, and, yeah, so I agree. If the sun were, you know, twice as far or, say, uh, from Jupiter, uh, the sun is supposed to be, um, I think it's four solar units or whatever, so um, 400 million miles or something like that. Yeah, the sun would be just another tiny little star, it would seem. Right. Yeah, you know, the Book of Enoch says that the moon and the sun are of the same size and proportion which if you, you know, watch the, um, the solar eclipse, it seems to uh, have that appearance as far as the way that all of that goes down. The, the moon, as far as the, the body of the moon, totally blocking out all aspects of the sun except for that, uh, the coronal effects, the, um, the sunlight that breaches beyond the, the body of the moon that's blocking it out and eclipsing it. Uh, it seems to be um, of the same size. I know science says that's because um, the moon is, uh, um, the sun is 400 times distance and what, 40 times larger than, or whatever, 40 times, 400, 400, 400 times larger yeah. and 40 times, yeah, d more distant. So. But yeah, that's what the Book of Enoch says. Well, you know, in, in terms of, uh, because I'm still like up in the air on this in terms of whether the, the moon is self-luminescing or whether it's reflected light. 
Um, and, you know, one of the major arguments against that idea is the one that you've made, you know, that um, the moon couldn't reflect sunlight and, and change the properties. But, you know, I'm not so sure. Um, uh, one thing, if you look into solar eclipses, um, either total or annual or solar eclipses, it's conditional that you have a new moon or like a no moon phase. So that sort of goes, you know, that sort of fits with the idea of it being reflected light. Um, but if you think about it, one of the ways I think about it is if the, if the moon and the sun are sort of out, outside of our little electromagnetic bubble here, um, which actually renders light visible, um, you can't, apparently, you can't see stars or you can't see light without something to reflect the light off of, much like you can't see something without re uh, light reflecting off of it. So it sort of goes hand in hand, but um, the way I think of it is if the, the moon's reflecting, sort of absorbing uh, some of the sunlight and sort of reflecting off different wavelengths of the same, the, the same original uh, mm -hmm. source of light, um, then passing through these different layers of atmosphere and electromagnetic fields that we have, uh, rendering it visible light. I could see something like that happening. I mean, I don't necessarily think that um, we should jump to the conclusion that because moonlight has different properties, then it couldn't possibly be reflected light. Um, right, I, right. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I, I'm still totally up to <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying, and also the the Book of Enoch does say that um, in a portion of it that the moon does reflect that of the sun's light. But again, in in my book where I talked about this particular passage, I brought up that same thing, and and then I also speculated at the end whether it had some kind of photosynthetic property, like you know plants are able to convert the sunlight and to change it into glucose or, or fuel for its growth, um, does the moon also convert it into um, its own light and um, perpetuate it in that way? Who knows? Yeah, Ooh, it's pretty Dave, wild. Dave, what would you just share? This is, looks pretty awesome. This video, what did you just share? That, that we we spoke about it earlier. Uh, you know, the the weightlessness in the space station. They talk about, um, you know, some of it's done in a vomit comet, some of it's done with wires, especially when they do those forward flips. Like, hey, look, we're in zero G. We can do forward flips, but we can't do -si do around each other or turn around. Um, this shows that you can, uh, uh, maybe you guys can link it below this video. Um, it, it shows that they, they levitated a frog who was with acoustic levitation, and the frog was fine. Um, so there are a couple scenes that I haven't been able to figure out um, where the astronauts are floating for long periods of time. Um, uh, but again, they did it in the movie Gravity, and, uh, you know, you can't figure that out either. Right. Um, but this is a, a, a distinct possibility for some of those extended scenes where they have an underground facility, they have, you know, a billion dollar acoustic levitation system and uh, hey, we're fooled. Yeah, and also what's going up in the skies, the heavens. I mean it's a possibility as far as those luminaries and how how they are there. Do you watch the videos of them? and the lights patterns dancing and moving and going about. I don't think that's man-made. I mean, it may be acoustic levitation or some form of quantum locking um, where, you know, magnetic uh, and electric forces are holding it in space. You guys have seen quantum locking, yes? No. No. <laughs> uh, I'll, 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 send you, I'll send you a video. Okay, cool. Well, it's basically, I, I think what that was, uh, quantum locking, was where they had this supercharged, it was like a super cool, super supercharged um, magnet or something. A, a, a superconductor, and that's, yeah. what I, that's why I like to call our sun a capacitor, because it's a superconducting capacitor. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I know, I, I'm pretty damn sure that the, the Earth itself is a giant, basically, Tesla coil or a giant uh, Absolutely. And right. so, you know, the sun, it seems as if, like, you know, it's almost as if the sun is, is something that's generated outside of the system, you know, but it's still related. I don't know. It's, it's still very sort of murky, but, uh, yeah. What about, what about the fact that the majority of the world that we live on is made up of salt water and how that's connection with uh, what the, the suns are? You know, you've got the sodium chloride and how it's necessary. I guess it's necessary with uh, chemical 
for uh, a battery, right? Huh. Yeah. yeah, it's got uh, uh, elect- high, high in electrolytes. Right. Well, I guess my suggestion is, and it's just a suggestion, obviously, but how it, it, say the world that we lived on was all fresh water, would we end up maybe losing the sun and the moon? Could that be the part of like some integral, like a uh, battery type system that we're actually living on, you know, and that the, it's necessary that we have all this salt water in order to have the moon and sun. I don't know. It's just a suggestion, but it seems to me if you were a designer and I can understand like Mark Sarge's argument, that you know, as a way of uh, keeping us in our place, but the same token, I mean, if I was the one designing it, would I make the majority of the water salty? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's something to think about. There's, there's, well, there has to be a relevant, something relevant to it also. The the sun um, being an electric capacitor um, affects salt water. You know, um, magnetism um, pulls on salt water. So maybe it's by design that there's so much salt in everything um, be, you know, that explains the, what we call the Coriolis effect. You know, the sun is plowing a path um, through the tropics, uh, the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer, and it's pushing all of the moisture in the air and the oceans um, through a magnetic force. It's, it's one uh, explanation that can be tested and proven versus the magical gravity moon you know, pulling the water, but not pulling us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ridiculous. But uh, in terms of the, the salt water, you know, it, it does make a lot of sense what you're saying, because um, you can, you can generate uh, electricity and propagate waves that are in, in salt water and, and water that's high in electrolytes. So yeah, there, that does make some sense. You know, from a game designer standpoint, I'd probably put salt in the water. Um, <laughs> All right. But uh yeah, that that's. Uh, it, I, I'm not sure. I, I would necessarily say that it's um, it's generating, you know, the the conditions to sort of render the sun and the moon. I'm I'm not sure, but it, it seems to me like there's a, a very delicate balance going on here, and it's all just uh, things resonating on different frequencies. You know, that's that's the way I look at it. And you know, the ground beneath us um, appears to be very solid and, and you know beneath that you've got lava which really doesn't work very well if it's a ball um have you ever seen a ball wrapped around lava but <laughs> if, we're, if we're sort of floating on the top here you know that makes a little bit more sense i think you know we definitely have lava beneath us it pops out of volcanoes still um so you know there's there's a lot of activity going on that's simply generated underneath our feet that we're not aware of and um i, I think that you know, spinning lava underneath us is probably not out of the question. And, you know, we've got spinning atmosphere above us and spinning stars above that. Um, why wouldn't we have spinning lava beneath us? You know, sort of, I don't know if that would be causal of everything else or just reacting to the same sort of ethereal uh, flow as everything else does. Hmm. Interesting stuff. It really makes, you know, the more you contemplate, once you grasp the fact that, uh, the cosmology and what our world actually is and looks like is completely different from what we've been told all our lives. Uh, it just makes you just question everything, doesn't it? And really, I mean, just, just, yeah, I think about why we have blue skies. And I know that they'll say it has something to do with, uh, or I guess, a reflection, a refraction of light. And uh, But um, is it really? I mean, why do we? I don't know. Why do it makes you think. Ask- Maybe it has to do with the waters above uh, the firmament, you know? Right. The waters on the on the earth are blue, and the waters in the sky are blue. Yeah, and you think about it, you think of, you know, so they've given us, you know, the, the excuse that they have given us is because of uh, the Van Allen belt, and they can't get through this radiation. But maybe it's, it has another, maybe they've lied about everything else, gentlemen. What yeah, they yeah. You know, what do, it, it really... Behooves us all, humanity, to question everything. Once again, I mean, which is it just goes to show, right now, this how wicked the system that is actually ruling this world is. That uh, 2016, 
we have to question everything again. Right. You know, I, when I, I my big thing was 9/11, Sandy Hook, and Boston. You know, and then came you know with all the other hoaxes around that. And I was like, wow, they lie to us about everything. You know, this is as big as it gets. And then comes the flat earth. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. So oh, no. what's, the next, what's the next revelation? That's what I'm thinking. What's the next one? You know, it's just, it's the next difference. one is that we're not even here and that we're literally <laughs> in the matrix. You know, right. when I refer to the documentary with Keanu Reeves called The Matrix, I tell it's a documentary. I mean, it's literally closer to the reality of our world than, than the one that we're taught. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Gentlemen, gentlemen, it, I think it has been an excellent, rewarding, enriching uh, uh, time this evening. I really appreciate you spending your time with me. Um, I think uh, it'd probably be good to start uh, clothing comments and inspirational thoughts or whatever you may have. And then also, uh, if you wouldn't mind going over your, the work that you're doing, where people can find your work, and uh, what's coming up in the future here for you, Joe. So, if you don't mind, and uh, I guess uh, I don't know who to start with. So, but okay, well, I'll start with Zen. How's this? <laughs> All right. Well, I I just want to say that you know I think these are the kind of dialogues, conversations, and evenings that individuals like myself and those that are part of this round table that this is greatly beneficial for the listening audience and for people that have never have even begun to go down this particular rabbit hole. And even for those that have, these are questions that all of us have and sharing dialogue and fellowship with you guys this evening has really um, benefited me and broadened my horizons on a lot of the things that I probably otherwise might not have ever have contemplated and the interaction, the sharing as far as testimony and the videos and all of that, I think it's a, it's wonderful discourse and it's something that I think will be greatly beneficial to those that listen to the archives at later time. Uh, as far as my work, uh, I run the website fallenangels.tv. I do a program on Truth Frequency Radio called Secrets Revealed every Saturday, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern, and on Revolution Radio, uh, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern. You can contact me, Zen Garcia, on Facebook. My author website is uh, zengarcia.com. I'm the author of nine books, my latest being The Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch. Awesome, man. I guess I'll go next. Um, this is John. Uh, you can find me basically on YouTube. Uh, my YouTube channel is The Morgile, T-H-E-M-O-R-G-I-L-E. Um, I think the T and the M are capital. Um, there was somebody impostering me and uh, making rude comments all over the place, so I'm the one that has like over 100 videos, not the guy that doesn't have any videos, so just so you know. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, just, just put out a new video just yesterday. Um, it's having to do with maps and some, maybe some different uh, ways to look at the matrix of the maps. Um, you know, not totally changing the definition of the word matrix. I'm not using the, the analogy. We're actually, uh, looking at the different ways to, uh, map out relative distances on a plane. Um, so, and, you know, I'm, I'm certainly no cartographer. Um, and I'm always, uh, always coming out with new stuff. So check me out on YouTube. And, uh, I think, um, I'll be talking to you again this week then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Saturday, um, brother Jonathan is going to be joining me on secrets or Bill to so definitely catch it. If you can also, my YouTube channel is endeavor freedom. Awesome, uh, man. All right. And, um, you know, I, I originally started out basically taking other people's work and compiling them. Like I'll, I'll go through hundreds of videos and go, look, okay, these six are the ones that you need to do. So I started the Facebook pages, exposing the big three, baller, skeptic, and deep inside the rabbit hole, um, breaking up the categories a little bit. So subscribe to those, follow my YouTube channel, D-I-T-R-H, stands for deep inside the rabbit hole. Um, I didn't even know how to make videos when I discovered, uh, when, I, when I got into this. Um, and now I'm, I'm, I make a lot of short videos, um, 
uh, probably because I have a short attention span myself. And, you know, mm-hmm. somebody, somebody that doesn't believe in uh, any of these things, especially the flat earth, is not going to sit down and watch uh, an hour video or two hour video right. or three hour video. So I put out a 60 second, a two minute, a three minute video that makes them scratch their head. Then they'll watch a five or a 10 minute video and then they'll go in, you know. So, so I, I bring them in, like bringing a fish up with some breadcrumbs or something. So check that out. It's <coughs> excuse me. It's all linked on deep inside the rabbit hole dot com, um, or just Google David Weiss flat Earth, and uh, I have a very high Google rating. It appears. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, once again, thank you very much for sharing your evening. You didn't have to. I I feel very privileged and honored that you were willing to do so. Um, then uh, we will be uh, together tomorrow night, right? On the right. Show. And um, I would suggest that, you know, we get together and do forums like this on um, Secrets Revealed, you know, and, and anytime you guys want to do it, the I think the round table is greatly beneficial for a lot of people. So I would be down for, um, you know, more collaborations in this regard and certainly would invite you and David um and and you know Jonathan of course coming on this Saturday but um to join me sometime on my show and uh, I'd love to have you as guests. Yeah, it was yeah, I think so. I think it'd be great to know. I know we've been talking about making this more uh of a regular thing and like I guess we haven't quite decided what the platform will be, but I think uh, having more of these kind of round tables uh definitely are advantageous and probably you know, let's face it. Uh, one of the things is you, uh, Jonathan and uh, Jaron and um, all the other. Oh gosh, what's the I'm just, and uh, Bob? Uh, <laughs> I forget about <laughs> and the and the Globe Busters. That that whole idea, I think, is a very. I think you do this if you can find like you know, just a couple like line, like-minded folks who are trying to be as rational and as reasonable and as intelligent. And yeah, and you know, I totally, totally forgot to plug uh, Globebusters. I don't know where my brain's at. It's it's twelve thirty midnight here, so <laughs> I'm good though. Right. Uh, we just changed times. We used to do, um, I guess, Sundays and Mondays. Now we do, um, uh, let's see here, Wednesdays at eight p.m. and Sundays at three p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So. Uh, Check out the Globebusters uh, every week, twice a week. So and we got a, a bunch of archives. So check that out. Yeah, and you know, so I, I would like to have that's cool. I would like to have all three of you on my show. Certainly, uh, Zen will be tomorrow, and I'm looking forward to that. We've had an interesting journey so far, <laughs> reading a lot of these uh, extra biblical texts like uh, the Adam and, Adam and Eve and and the Book of Adam and Eve and all those other things, and just the insights that, that you know you just don't hear. From your traditional, uh, you know, churchy type of churchianity, if you will. So that's what I think I'm looking really forward to tomorrow night. Um, uh, I would like to have all three uh, either together or individually on my show down the road. Uh, definitely, Dave, if you're game in the next couple of weeks, I'd like you to come back on my show and we talk a little more about your your individual research. Also, I would really like to talk to you or hear from you your spiritual journey, because I find that fascinating. You know, whether or not you are in the same camp or whatever, or you know what I mean, you're not, you know, it doesn't matter. What just matters is just to learn about your journey and understand where you come from. So sure. I think, you know what I mean? I think that you're a very interesting man. So I, I, I'd like to make a one additional plug. Um, you know, a lot of people are listening to this research and they really like it. Um, and a lot of a lot of sites, a lot of people, we spend a lot of time on this, and it's um, we don't do it for the money, but a lot of us need uh, you know some income from it, and uh, people have donation buttons, and a lot of people are reluctant to even donate a couple of dollars because it's just not something they're comfortable with, which is fine. Um, I just want to point out, like Jaronism, he spends so much time on this stuff and does such great videos. Uh, there's a great way to support him. If you go to jaronism.com and click the support button, he has a link that says, it says Amazon. Anyone that buys anything on Amazon, if you just go to his site, click Amazon, and then do your shopping. 
It's everything's exactly the same as if you typed in Amazon.com, and then he gets like two percent commission off of whatever you do, and that'll support him so he can keep doing this amazing work and waking the world up. So it doesn't cost you anything. Everybody uses Amazon. If you could just remember, go to Amazon through his site. You're donating and supporting um, the Flat Earth Research and the freedom of humanity. Yep. Here, here. And don't forget uh, also supporting Jonathan and his uh, YouTube channel and his work, uh, No More Guile, No More Guile. And don't forget also Zen Garcia and supporting him and also Truth Frequency Radio because, uh, quite frankly, um, and, well, let's be honest. None of us are making any money doing this. So not, we're not making a killing, that's for sure. I don't think. Well, actually, let's, let's be honest. We're not even making any money. Uh, of course, uh, this, is, this has cost me. I can't tell you how much money I've spent put into this. Um, I'm, I'm just saying, if you want to donate, sure, everyone loves donation. I think uh, Jonathan, you've got a donation button. But if you're not up for donating, but you're gonna be buying yourself stuff, do it. So. You know, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt anybody. It only helps. And then, uh, you know, well, the love you know, can be spread around. The, the way I like to put it is, I I do spend a lot of time uh, making videos. I've made a bunch of videos, uh, just you know, as a proponent of this whole flat Earth movement. And I do lots and lots and lots of shows. And so it does cost up a lot of time. And yeah, no, I I've made um, no money doing it except for you know some ad revenues on YouTube, which have been slim to none. Um, until recently, I had a, a couple of good months because I changed some things. I put non-skippable ads and stuff. Um, but honestly, if it hasn't, if it hadn't been for the community actually supporting my channel, I never would have been able to, you know, continue doing what I was doing, and you know, keep keep a place to live and keep the internet and the lights on. So, you know, it really does um, help out, and I don't expect everyone to, to contribute to my efforts. But at the same time, everything I put out is free. Um, if you think it's worth something, then great. And if you think it was worth nothing, then that's fine too. Um, I've never, you know, forced or impressed anyone to to support my efforts. But if you'd like to, the the options there. And I really only set that sort of thing up um, in response to people that asked for it. So I, I never would have been a million years um, thought to initiate something like that on my own. So just so y'all know. Yeah, perfect. John, it sounds like you're. You're uh, losing your voice. You've been talking a lot recently. Yeah, I've, well, I've had, I've actually had a touch of laryngitis um, that I got over, and it's been, you know, this the cold weather and then the warm weather and then the cold weather. Yeah, right. so I'm probably a bit froggy. Sorry, guys. Well, Gemma, don't hang up on me, but we're going to end the show. And uh, folks, uh, once again, this is uh, uh, been a, you know, life is a fascinating journey if you want it to be and if you allow it to be, and. Uh, it's interesting. Life is just a joy when you let it be interesting, regardless of where you're at. Also, I say God bless to you and take care. And talk to you soon. Oh, by the way, don't forget tomorrow night, uh, Zen will be with me, and then Thursday night, Jared from Jaredism will be with me. So, all right, God bless. Take care. <laughs>